What's the psychology of the fact that Stu learned a term about objects and immediately started applying it to people? <laughs> <laughs> If you want more Draft Zero more often, please consider joining our wonderful cohort of Patreons. However, this episode in particular is brought to you by ScriptUp. Now, regular listeners know that ScriptUp are story consultants with industry expertise. They don't promise any of that access to market bullshit. They just help you make your script better via their excellent report and a follow-up feedback call. And that feedback call is super valuable. If you're like me and you think with your mouth open, you know that often discussing ideas is how you find solutions to problems. We've used script up and they were super helpful for our project. And we've also heard from listeners who sing their praises that say that their written analysis is really thoughtful and considered, but that the follow-up call really does help, that it helps them diagnose things that are unseen and also helps them spitball possible solutions in a really creative environment. But the best news we've heard recently for Stu and my ego, and also hopefully for your ego, dear listeners, is that Script Up has told us that when they get a script from a Draft Zero listener, those scripts are a cut above. This means that you, dear listener, must be a better writer just because you love listening to three-hour podcasts about screenwriting. (laughs) Jokes aside, I think having a shared passion for the screenwriting craft, and that's why we're all here, is awesome. Ego stroking aside, if you would like 10% off ScriptCrup story consultancy services, please use the promo code DZ10, and you can find the links and the promo code in our show notes. Hi, I'm Stu Willis. And I'm Chaz Fisher. I'm Mel Killingsworth. And welcome to Draft Zero, a podcast where an ensemble of filmmakers are going to get together and try to work out what makes great, and maybe some not so great, screenplays work. (laughs) So this is part two of our ensemble's run. Now, last episode, part one, we explored what makes an ensemble and what are the different dials you can turn in an ensemble. So how many characters you have, how many stories those characters have, whether you're in their POV or not, how much they're interacting with each other, et cetera, et cetera. Go and listen to that episode. This part two, we're looking at genres of films where the plot or the conventions of those genres require a large number of characters. To wit, we are looking at Pitch Perfect, our stand-in for the uh, quote-unquote sports movie, Glass Onion, the locked room murder mystery, the 2022 entry into the Scream franchise, cunningly called Scream, but I believe Mel has a separate name for it. I will insist upon calling it Five Cream. <laughs> that entry being the slasher movie. And then we're going to do the large family drama holiday movie, uh, in this instance, The Family Stone. And in this episode... We are looking particularly at these films. They inherently require an ensemble, a large number of characters for plot reasons. And the challenge faced by these films, that we're going to explore how they've addressed those challenges, hopefully well, although it sounds like there's some debate about that, is how to service those characters such that they don't feel like they are only there to service the plot. Okay, I'm going to be slightly annoying here, Chad. <laughs> We've mentioned it a, a few times in the last episode. What do we mean by, like, servicing characters or accessing characters? It's something that writers do say a lot. Oh, we need to make sure we service all the characters or, yeah. you know, and, and characters aren't a car. In terms of answering that question, like we, we went around and around a lot in the uh, last episode. And I don't want to get too bogged down by this question, but- we, we got into, I think Alien was the best example where each of those characters felt like they had lives of their own separate to a quote unquote protagonist or main story, right? Um, and we're going to look at the different tools, well, not at Alien in particular, but, you know, we're going to look at different tools that hopefully give that feel of each of your characters having... I guess, an independent life or their own journey, their own point of view. Goals, obstacles, arcs, life of their own, I think, is a really basic, you know, blot test. It's interesting because I think servicing the characters is kind of maybe the way that writers talk about it. And and it's about accessing the characters for the audience, right? So the audience feel like they've got a handle on who the character is. And I think it's a challenge, as you say, for these kinds of films, because if you're doing 
like a bit character, like a, a character that exists only within one scene. An example I love is from No Country for Old Men when my mate Javier's character comes into the gas station and makes the owner of the gas station flip a coin. We learn a lot about it, that character, but he doesn't really exist for plot reasons other than to flip the coin. In fact, his thematic connection, which is, you know, in relationship to Chagot, actually means that we reveal a lot of the characters. So, it's in some ways, it's easier to create characters that feel quite well-rounded and give them little moments, you know, like, like in Die Hard where the henchman grabs the chocolate bar because they're not actually largely servicing the plot. These kinds of films, when they're more integrated, is is kind of where it becomes harder Right? Because mm. otherwise you're going to get someone like Ben Shapiro writing an article about how everything has to move the plot forward. And, and if you're not moving the plot forward or our understanding of character forward, mm. then it's bad writing, which mm. is, you know. Mm. And I'm, I'll probably get into this a little bit in the individuals when we talk about it. But I think some of the advantages that ensemble films have over other ensemble films is are they an established, you know, a repeating genre? Basically, can they afford to get a certain actor who brings with them, whether through their persona or through their history of other films, already something about them that they show up on screen and you say, oh yes, I know who this person is, especially within this genre or how they are being introduced or presented, like you immediately get a grasp of them. And that is um, an advantage to some films like, so for example, Five Cream over Pitch Perfect, like an established entry in a genre that is very well known. People are, you know, killing themselves or each other or others to get <laughs> into that film franchise as opposed to something that's uh, a complete shot in the dark. But you usually know when you're writing... You usually know if you're writing something that's the fourth or fifth entry in something that you have that advantage. A hundred percent. Our listeners are, uh, and, you know, Stu and myself are probably less likely to, at this point in our careers, to be writing the fourth or fifth entry into a franchise. And perhaps we want those characters feeling serviced on the page more so than, by the way, this guy is two dimensional. Cast someone good here, please. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that that's something to keep in mind when we're talking about these films, like which of them they were when they were being written. Uh, even the original Scream is something that would be very different to writing, you know, the fifth one, even though they have basically the same function, the same character, et cetera. So that's how they function as films. And I think what screenwriters can take from that is that there is types or tropes that you can lean into. Well, I was going to say that character types are a tool that we can use. Are there other lenses that I'm going to start with you, Stu, because you have the better defined list on our agenda of what are the lenses that you're going to be looking at these films through? All right. So the, the thing that I've been really thinking about a lot when watching these films is character dimension, right? That really what we want or what I'm looking for and what I want to be in control of in my writing is dimensionalizing characters. What do I mean by character dimension? Um, I'm going to be, go back to Aristotle. Character. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> We're going to be here a while. <laughs> no, no, no. All character is, is habitual action, right? So it's the character doing the same thing repetitively is what creates character, right? It's what they do and they do it consistently. But if they, we only see them do the one thing, behave in the one way all the time, they're literally one-dimensional characters. They are that type, you know, whether they're a jock or the murderer or the doctor, like, you know, those kinds of archetypes we associate with being one-dimensional because we've seen that group of characteristics together. So, I'm interested in dimensionalizing characters and there's a few ways I've been thinking about that, right? So, one of them is that group dynamic that we talked about before, which is, I originally said collaborative and I think cooperative is a better word. So, I think there are three ways of, it's a way of thinking about group dynamics. Are they cooperative? Are they combative? And are they competitive? Competitive, right? So I think the difference between cooperative and combative is combative is directed at each other, right? So it's two people that are fighting, and we'll see good examples of that in the family stone. And that is different from competitive, because competitive you could be isolated from the characters from each other and still be going after the same thing. You're not fighting each other, but you're you're effectively like running your own race, right? Like athletics and running is a really good example of something that is highly competitive but isn't combative in nature. And cooperative is is working together. So a good example of that is the character Brett in Alien played by Harry 
Dean Stanton, where there's a running joke that he always agrees with Parker, who's the chief engineer, right? So he's cooperative together, right? They're not collaborative. They're not solving the problems together, but he, he's quite supportive. So the thing is, you can create character dimension by showing a character who's cooperative with one person, and then you put them in a room with someone else, and they become combative, right? Right. And so that leads me to what I call the intimacy spectrum, which I think is there's three kind of broad ways that the audience can experience time with the character, which is the private, which is one-on-one. So when we see a, a character in private by themselves, then we have them, we see the characters in personal situations. And personal, I would say, is like with two, maybe three other people tops, right? And then public. Public can be in like the work sphere. It could be in a domestic sphere. It could be in, you know, a group setting, right? So, I think public in the family stone. The family, when it's all together, is kind of like a public sphere of that character. And so, I think if you show the characters behaving differently in those different spaces, we'll get it. We'll see literally more dimension to them because we see differences. We're basically saying like we're, we're implying limits to their habits. Like if they act in this particular way, oh, this person's really cruel. And then we see them be, you know, save the cat. I mean, that's what it is. Or we see someone that's nice and they kick the dog. That is building in dimension. We're looking for contradictions. We're looking into the limitations and the complexities of their their behavior. So that's what I've been kind of particularly paying attention to, how these films play with group dynamic and how they play with the level of intimacy that the audience has with particular characters. I've also been thinking about the power balance within a group dynamic. So I think you've got characters that are an equal setting that are equally cooperative, combative, or competitive. And but I think on the other end of that spectrum, you've kind of got what I call coercion and compliance. Right. So you have a character who coerces the other characters and the other characters are compliant. That can be cooperative in a group dynamic, and we'll see this in Pitch Perfect, but it is not necessarily completely willingly cooperative, that the characters that have less power in that situation are more compliant. So that's that's something else I've been kind of thinking about, but it's not particularly refined yet. What about you, Mel? Uh, I'm really interested in looking at, from a writing standpoint, most of these ensembles, at least in this episode, I think in episode three, we have some slightly smaller ones, are fairly large. So I'm really interested in handling how the script handles the size of the ensemble, uh, partly in relation to the genre, because some of them will handle it slightly differently. In some ways, it's actually easier to talk about how they're handling it, because there's just so many of them, there's not going to be as much maybe nuance able to be leveraged onto your characters. Um, And I'll also talk about like the introduction, how to introduce your characters and then how to keep them distinct throughout the film, throughout your screenplay writing. And that, because those are, you can introduce them all, but if you never bring back those things throughout people, you know, they show up three things scenes later and someone you need to maybe do something to jog the audience's memory about who this person is. What do they want? What is their obstacle? How do they relate to this other person that they're talking to in the scene? So from a writing standpoint, how do you do that? And I think that's, that's mostly the lens that I'm bringing to this episode. And you Chaz? Well, I think I'm going to do more subsets of you guys. I'm going to look more granular at the audience intimacy spectrum is a good one, Stu, but I, I'm going to, in looking at these films, that different, the group dynamics were the ones that revealed most character to me in these particular films. And I'd just like to note that I, one of the reasons why I love the three defining items that you've come up with is I like that competitive can be combative. It's just that everyone's after the same Goal. It can be separate, but it can also be they're in conflict, right? Mm. Whereas what I think of as combative is I've got a goal and you've got a goal and we can't both achieve it. Or like the goals are inherently in conflict, potentially. It's, it's, it's a way that's helped me go when a situation's more combative versus competitive. And I do think a lot of these films service the characters well just by spending time in their point of view outside of the main character's journey, if there is even a, a, a main character. I think I do think all of these films do have a main character. They'll have more than one, I think. Yeah. But they all have one or two or arguably three. Yeah. Okay. Shall we roll trailer on Pitch Perfect? Welcome to Barton University. You call yourself Fat Amy? Yeah, so tweets like, you don't do it behind my back. 
We need eight perfect singers if we want to be champions. Turn the beat they may not be perfect. These songs are tired. You should be taking risks. But they'll pitch slap the competition. Let's remix this business. I, I, I like the way you work it. Yeah. I got a bag it up, baby. Pitch perfect. I'm also good at pirate dancing. Who wants to summarize what Pitch Perfect is about? <laughs> I think Sue should have to. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> Pitch Perfect is borderline a musical set at a university and it's set around competitive a cappella. And it opens with the Bellas, uh, an all female group, losing to an all male rival group because a um, character called Aubrey vomits on stage. A surprise. This now, this is how you bring super excitement to the right. international <laughs> championship of Collegiate Cup. She had a week's worth of lunch and lost it. Oh, she didn't lose it. We know exactly where it is. It's all over the third oh, row. No. And then no one wants to be a member of the Bellas after that point. And then we cut to, and it's a great storyteller cut to the, the main character, Becca, played by Anna Hendrick, who's kind of a DJ. She's into producing music. And her father is basically like, I'm paying for you to be at university and, you know, you're not going to go and follow your dreams and you should mm-hmm. go and join some clubs. And, and Becca ends up basically joining the Bellas and a bunch of other singers end up joining the Bellas. And it's basically their journey through competitive a cappella. To go to your point, Sue, about it being a musical and music taking up a lot of the airtime, I don't think any of these characters in this film are particularly well sketched. I agree. The point is not to have an in-depth character study for any of these characters. They are not three-dimensional, deeply motivated. No, and I don't think they intend to be. But I do think they are all relatively equally serviced. You know, Becca more than any other character, but I think the rest of them kind of on a level. I completely agree. I think part of the reason that Becca is so well serviced, as well as her, a little bit of her love interest, is we get to spend time with Becca when she is by herself. And we spend time with her when she's with one-on-one with people like her, her dad or her love interest. And then we see her within the group. Like, Jesse, we get to see by himself after Beck has broken up with him. But largely, the only moment we see the other characters by themselves in their kind of private space is when the Bellas get to reform. So, there's this Dias ex machina moment where a team is kicked out from the finals and the Bellas get bumped up. It's a great montage. And it, <laughs> here's the thing, though. That's one of those examples of what I'm saying about reinforcing character because we've met all of these characters. We've established their one or two major personality traits, etc. And then, mm. the, you know, this montage comes two thirds of the way through and it reinforces. We, we're seeing them all by themselves and it reinforces things we already have found out about them, whether it was in a group dynamic or a one-on-one dynamic, etc. It's quite funny. So it's played for laughs, but it's not a played to reveal more depth to the characters. Nope. Oh, I don't, I don't feel that's fair. You may not feel it's fair. <laughs> but So it's Aubrey, who's the yeah. leader of the Bellas, whose wound creates the group dynamic. So she mm-hmm. is the she has been ru- ruling the Bellas with an iron fist <laughs> who just wants to do it exactly the same, right? Mm-hmm. This is, she is coercive. Everyone else is compliant. She's got a combative dynamic mm-hmm. with Becca because Becca's got some ideas. Like, Aubrey is kind of the antagonist of the, the group, right? There is the opportunity there to show complexity to that character and why she is the way she is. And when we see her by herself, all she is is in the gym, right? It tells us nothing that we don't... You can see it as reinforcing, and that's fine. Like, they've chosen to reinforce that character that she is by herself and making sure that she's, like, working hard. The point is that she is a loner and she has caused herself to be a loner because of her reaction to her, you know... But I feel like we learn more about Cynthia Rose's character. We learn more about Fat Amy's character in that montage. So I think Chloe's a big one, and I think Chloe actually probably has even a bigger arc than Aubrey (laughs) in terms of... yeah. So, Chloe, for those who haven't seen her or haven't seen her for a while, is the kind of like co-captain, the first officer to Aubrey, right? So, Chloe is the only other one who was in the Bellas in the previous year, and Chloe is an enabler of Aubrey, right? (laughs) She is many things to Aubrey, one of which is an enabler. 
all my point is that they made a choice there. They had a moment of privacy. And then there's later a reveal that Aubrey has this wound to do with her father saying, you know. I know that I have been hard on everyone here. But I am my father's daughter. And he always said, if at first you don't succeed, pack your bags. That is revealed through dialogue. We could have seen more of the effect on her of losing the Bellas in a moment of privacy. She's putting on a winning smile for everyone. We could cut to her at that moment if we don't have any other thing and see how it's affecting her. And the answer is they've chosen. I don't know why they chose that. That, that's to be honest, that's how little seeing her at the gym doing some stretches tells me about this character. <laughs> okay. All right. I will argue with this. because So one of the things that we've heard her reinforce multiple times to them is how important things like cardio and fitness and blah, blah, blah are to your ability to perform a cappella, right? And so when we see her at the gym, yes, she's technically alone. Like she doesn't have her friends. Like we see a lot of the other people are surrounded like, oh, they have a life outside of this. She doesn't have a life outside of acapella. I think showing her with friends or with her family would actually be an antithesis to what we've learned. But she's so, she has nothing else, but she's actually quite driven. It's that idea of like the uh, the famous Mia Hamm quote about like, you know, the champion is actually the person who is driving themselves and who doesn't need to be at team practice to be driven by a coach or to be driven driven by their teammates, but they can drive themselves when they are alone at, you know, first thing in the morning, practicing by themselves. And I think that is actually what we are meant to take from her moment is that she's so obsessed with this and she has nothing else. I think it's both of those things. But to Stu's point, that doesn't add anything new to what we've seen before. No, it reinforces. Through the lens of dimensionality, which I'm interested in, they have chosen to keep the character one dimensional. Yeah. There was an opportunity to give her a second dimension or a third dimension, and they have not done it. Right. And I think I think when you have 20 characters trying to give them all three dimensions is not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, but they could have just chosen someone else. That's all I'm saying as an exercise. <laughs> in this film, we've broadly got the team of the Barden Bellas. The team of the treble makers, the all-male group that that win most of these competitions, and we've got other very ancillary characters around Becca, like Becca's dad and the the roommate, the DJ of the university radio. But I think we should do two things. One is distinguish the, the fact that the film starts up and is driven by winning the competition. That is the plot of the film. Will the Bellas win this championship. That's what, that's the question that's posed by the opening. And it's the plot that's resolved at the end, you know, and throughout it, it's like, can the Bellas come together and work as a team and all those wonderful sports tropes. But what I kind of like about the film is it really does distinguish, I think, between Aubrey, who is, well, I I wouldn't say the only one with a wound, but like her wound, and she is driving that plot right? She wants the Bellas to win more than anything. And then you've got Becca, who is pretty much resisting being part of the Bellas in almost every way. Refuse the call. But just not like right up until that, that the end of that montage that we're talking about, where Becca actually comes and confesses her wound and, you know, tries to bring the group together and becomes a better person and blah, 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 blah. But until that point, that's the only point where she's like, I'm in this to help you guys win the plot of the movie, right? In it to win it. So I, I'm I'm fascinated just in terms of that sort of ability to create ensemble is it's a lot of these characters have very different functions in relation to the the plot. Particularly the the two characters that get the most airtime are Becca and Aubrey. But I this does not feel like a two hander buddy cop protagonist antagonist story. It feels Slightly broader than that. I would say it's more Becker's movie, but with a lot of ancillary characters who we can look at how have they been serviced. And I think one of the best places to start would be to Mel's point, looking at their introductions, in particular, the fair, the activities fair scene. Sure. Yep. The activities fair, which is where we meet in particular Fat Amy, played by Australia's Rebel Wilson. We meet Chloe and Aubrey. We've been vaguely introduced to Jesse and Benji. So Mm. Jesse, who's Becca's love interest, and Benji, who's his roommate. But they come back into the fair and we we actually really meet them. And they both want to be in the Troublemakers. They both want to be in the Troublemakers, but (laughs) Benji really wants to be in (laughs) the Troublemakers. Bless his heart. 
Benjamin Applebaum. Uh, I saw you guys perform at the Mall of America like three years ago. Totally changed my life. I have not stopped thinking about you since. Thank you. Uh, and Bumper, huge fan. Your arrangement of Love and Spoonfuls, Do You Believe in Magic, inspired me to become a certified illusionist. Wow. The smell of your weird is actually affecting my vocal cords, so I'm going to need you to scoot, skedaddle. Well, why don't we just exchange emails and then totally hang out right now together? No. Hard pass. And we get more access to the troublemakers as well. So we start meeting the personalities of the troublemakers and how much of a douchebag bumper is and how much <laughs> of like, and the other thing that this movie does really well with a lot of introductions, even characters who we barely know their name, right, is we get a key characteristic like, oh, it's the guy who rides a unicycle everywhere, right? It's the really sex starved, you know, college student who's like 19 and who's basically like, this is a buffet. It's an all you can eat. I've been waiting for this. You you know, give it to me. But you you start seeing the characters, even the troublemakers, when they're set up as being, you know, oh, that's the nerd. That's the guy who does magic. That's the guy who rides a unicycle. You know, this is the guy who makes the inappropriate comments at every possible juncture. So they're setting up really vaguely tertiary characters with things that will become repeated motifs every time we see them again. So it does all of those things. And I think, you know, you could do them one after another, you know, you can say this is the wealth of information that we want to see in this big introductory scene across and introduce all our ensembles and go, what is their, their running condition? But the thing that I just want to point out is that they do a lot of these scenes not in Becca's point of view. Mm -hmm. So this is the scene that I think does the best at kind of setting up mm -hmm. what these characters want separate to Becca. So Aubrey and... Chloe are trying to recruit people back to the Bellas after Aubrey's fantastic performance in the previous final. Oh, now that you puked your way to the bottom, you might actually consider me? I auditioned for you three times and never got in because you said my boobs look like baloney. The word's out. Bellas is the laughing stock of acapella. Good luck auditioning this year, douchebees. Oh my God, this is a travesty. And they have, they do have an interaction with Becca where they try to recruit Becca, but she's the third person they try to recruit. We separately see them go after Baloney Barb and we see Fat Amy's performance, which also introduces us to Rebel Wilson. And then Rebel Wilson teams up with Becca to, you know, go through a mm -hmm. couple of different activities as well to give us a bit more of insight into Becca. But you've separately got Benji and Jesse approaching the troublemakers and that is completely separate to to Becca. So I'm just wanting to point out that we're going to find in all of these films big scenes with almost all the characters introducing tons of different elements to them and this one is the only one I think out of the different examples where you've got very separate points of view. And I think I, I agree, but I actually think that it, that Pitch Perfect has two and one comes maybe 10 minutes later, which is in the auditions and mm. Becca doesn't come into the auditions until the very end. Now, yeah. it does it with the musical. It does it with the Since You've Been Gone, which <clears throat> mm -hmm. will just like sidebar that I'm going to do a whole breakdown of that scene on Shot Zero because <laughs> I think that it does it really well. It's, it's split screen and it's doing it through a musical but how you meet all of these characters, either if we've met them before, which a couple of them we've met before, we see Jesse and we've met him before, but it actually introduces a few of them as well. So it introduces Stacy, whom we haven't met before. It introduces Lily, whom we haven't met before. And it immediately hits you while they're singing with their primary quote unquote characteristic, which will come through. So again, because it's such a massive ensemble and it has to serve all these, I do think you have two scenes and the one of them, you're right, is that recruitment fair. And then the second one is the audition scene. And both of them are outside of Becca's point of view. Yes. From a technical point of view, right? Something that's clever is that the opening scene is where we meet Aubrey and we meet Chloe, mm -hmm. right? That then gives us permission later on to cut inside their point of view without the audience going, hang on, who is this, right? But we do do that quote unquote storyteller cut to Becca, right? To single her out and go, this is the character that we need to follow, right? That's what we're telling the audience. 
we get two full musical performances before we get to Becca. I mean, yes. I, we we get that whole big scene and two full musical performances plus some comedy bits before we get to her. And it does set up Aubrey as the protagonist of mm-hmm. the movie. I'm almost surprised when Becca takes over the movie. Because I think Aubrey becomes this like weird quasi antagonist. It's quite interesting, you know, how they set her up. I will say that the way that film is structured, Becca is absolutely the protagonist. She gets, she refuses the call, right? They ask her to join. She says no. And then I uh, ask her to audition. She says no. And then they convince her to audition again. The, what I was trying to say before I got derailed, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm talking about how you structure point of view and, and you can cut to point of view, right? Sure. So we introduced yeah. Aubrey and Chloe. Okay, and that means that we can then cut to their point of view, which is what makes the fair work. Then we have this storyteller cut to Becca where she meets the love interest, Jesse, which also gives us then permission to cut to Jesse, right? So it allowed by introducing these characters, you can kind of start coming back to them, but you can't do that for everything, right? So that's where we get like Cynthia and uh, Lily and the others at the auditions, and then we can kind of cut to them. But absolutely, I think the, the, the great thing about a point of view of other characters outside side of the main character is it quite literally shows them having a want that is different to the plot line or the storyline in a broader sense of the main character. I mean, I do think the Becca is structured. It's a kind of somewhat of a hero's journey for her. She refuses call. She accepts the call. You know, she comes back with the elixir, you know. <laughs> it, it, it's using elements of that stuff to make her feel yeah. that she's yeah, yeah. the protagonist, right? And that they would not have won without her. Yeah, you've got all of her goals and then you've got almost this group goal. And at some point they finally converge after the montage, like you said. You know, as her desire to be a DJ is ultimately folded into how the group wins, Mm -hmm. right? It's not Fat Amy's desire to... What is Fat Amy's desire? (laughs) Well, Fat Amy... So she, she actually states it in that scene just before Becca returns, but Becca's on her way to returning. The Bellas know that they're back in competition but Beck is not there and they're letting out all their issues with each other. And I think it's in that scene that Fat Amy just says, You treat me all like right, shit. No, okay, just shut up, everyone. Come on, I joined this group so I could hang out with a bunch of really cool chicks. And also because I was really sick of all my boyfriends and I need to get away from that. But <laughs> this is some serious horse shit. And that that sort of Aubrey's, Aubrey, look, Aubrey's arc is to win, right? But in order to do that, but also just in order to, you know, become better as a person, she has to learn how to loosen up and how to be a little bit more, um, you know, fluid or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Flexible. Yeah. And in some ways that's actually coming down to meet Amy's goals, right? And like, this should be fun. This should be something where you're doing, it's a community gathering. Yes, we want to win, but if that is the only goal, half these people wouldn't be here. They're here to become better musicians. They're here to further their career goals. They're here to, you know, network or make friends or all of the above. And Aubrey's got to be able to be a little bit more flexible and a little bit more malleable. And that is, and like the complete opposite end of the spectrum is Fat Amy. She does not give a shit about winning. I almost called it nationals. That's very glee thing. But she does, she wants to be there because she's having fun, because she's good at singing and she enjoys showing off what she's good at, et cetera. They're squeezing together because Amy does become a little bit competitive. Then, you know, Becca almost ties all of those needs and wants together a bit. And the climactic song kind of heroes out, Mm -hmm. and this is a term that I really like that is relevant to ensembles, heroes out each of the characters that we particularly have spent time with. So Becca gets her moment, Fat Amy gets her moment, right? Aubrey gets her moment, Chloe gets her moment because we've established that Chloe Mm. sings low. You know, Cynthia gets her moment and- Lily doesn't really get one. Lily does, she beatboxes. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, yep. So the arc for the group, if you think of the group as a character, is it goes from a cooperative, it's quite cooperative, but it is coercive and compliant, right? That's the power dynamic. And then they maybe they go from cooperative to collaborative. You could see it that, but the journey is that the power 
power is what changes, that they become more equal and that they're treated more fairly. And Becca is, yeah, Becca gets to do a lot of the arrangements, but that's her skill. Mm. It's not that yeah, right. she's not shown necessarily to be a better singer than anyone else. And so that is an arc for the group. So thinking about what the group is as a character can be a really great structural device to make it feel like there's a journey. It's, it adds literally dimensions <laughs> to the group, right? But the group itself, as I said, is, is largely cooperative, but it does have Becca being slightly combative, right? The whole way. She is the most combative mm-hmm. person, but she still ultimately complies. Yeah. Yeah, she complies, but she makes Aubrey comply to a lot of her wishes as well. Like, I do think that they 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 force each other to sort of meet in the middle. Mm. In terms of I- talking about the group dynamic, every time they have a rehearsal scene, there's basically a point where- Becca says, I think it would be better if we do it my way. Like, even at the very (laughs) first one, she says, there's nothing from this century in this song list. And Aubrey's response is always, this is the way that we got to the finals last year. That's how we're going to get to the finals this year. And then Chloe is, you said, uh, Stu, she's 2IC. She's like, oh, should we consider? And Aubrey says, no. (laughs) And that, like, somewhat annoyingly, I feel like that, beat gets repeated three times like that exact dynamic like it doesn't evolve that much but the way that they keep the group evolving or that sense of evolution is that they they go into cutting between an internal group scene and an external group scene where the group is having to perform so you've got auditions then first rehearsal external internal in terms of the group then they've got their first performance external chloe confesses her nodes are you talking about the riff off no that's the after the first performance right 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 yes but th- but that's an excellent example right they've had a another rehearsal that's gone poorly expressed the exact same dynamic but then they have the riff off Right. And then that actually allows the group to start performing together because they're in competition with other groups around them. And having fun. So we get more dimension to the group. I mean, that's something the film does very well is that we see that they actually have a really great time singing. Like they're singing in the bus. They love it. They actually enjoy hanging out each other. It's the competition that sucks. It's what's draining the life out of it. So that great dimensionality to the whole group. And this has given me a mind bomb, Chaz, is that private, personal, public thing can be applied to a group if you think of a group of characters, which may be two or three. In this case, it's, it really feels like it's five or six, though there's others within that group. You can have, what is this group like in private when it's just the group? What is this group like on a personal level when, when they're interacting with just one other group or person, right, as a group? And then what is this group like in public? And you can create dimensionality to the characters, but also the feeling of the group by creating situations where you can see what they're like. It may not come up in any of the other films, but I've got a feeling like something like Glass Onion, you've got the dynamic of the friends group, right? Oh, and in the family stone, it's definitely there as well. Yeah. So my question for Chaz is how does the internal group external thing come out in Glass Onion? And my question for Stu is how does each character quote unquote hero out Mm -hmm. in Glass Onion? Is this a good transition to Glass Onion? Are we done with Pitch Perfect? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it is. Disruptors have assembled. Welcome, gang. We got a great weekend. Who's that? Benoit Blanc, the detective? Mr. Prompt. I cannot overstate my gratitude to be here. When's the murder mystery start? I've invited you all to my island. Because tonight, a murder will be committed. My murder. Once you're dead, will we still be able to talk to you? Yeah, I'm not playing dead the whole weekend, dude. This is truly delightful. Across the island, I've hidden clues. You will have to closely observe each other. If anyone can name the killer, that person wins our game. Any questions? (laughs) Alibarry. That has a kick. Oh my God, what happened? I can't even remember when I first heard it in in the context of, like, it was on a set somewhere and they're like, oh, we need to hero out this object. (laughs) So it was like putting some light on it or shooting it in such a way that we know that we need to pay attention to this object, right? But I've heard it used in other contexts since then. So hero out is basically 
uh, however, whatever cinematic techniques you use, which may be narrative, they may be visual, they may be something else, whatever techniques you use to say to the audience, this is something that we need to pay attention to, right? And so all the cut twos in Glass Onion, which you will talk about, like all mm-hmm. the character introductions are literally mm-hmm. throwing out all those characters. But it's a great term. I will at some point write that into a script and be like, we hero <laughs> out, you know. <laughs> What's the psychology of the fact that Stu learned a term about objects and immediately started applying it to people? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm, as much as I appreciated that segue, Mel, should we perhaps now summarize what it is? I think, Mel, this is for you. To summarize Glass Onion? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Glass Onion is the second in an entry of Ryan Johnson's reimagining of classical Agatha Christie style mysteries, where you collect a big ensemble of people, give them a broad characteristic, usually somewhat snide and related to social mores, <laughs> and then let them bump up against each other and interact. Uh, and as one of them tries to solve, a mystery of a murder. Right. In this case, quite specifically, it's a group of friends getting invited to an island, right? Yep. An island from a tech billionaire, Miles Bronn, who's Edward Norton's character, and he's basically hosting a murder mystery game, right? He's hosting a murder mystery party that becomes a real murder. And It's the newest of all of them, but we're definitely going to spoil it. And I think that, you know, it's out on Netflix. Most people will have seen it by now. And it's it's actually even more inherently Agatha Christie than uh, Knives Out in terms of the setup. Well, look, Murder on the Orient Express or... Murder on the Nile, Death on the Nile. I thought that it could have gone in that direction where they all work together to- Absolutely. Okay, so it's really similar to a lot of Agatha Christie, a lot of Dorothy Parker, and particularly a movie, The Last of Sheila, which is, again, some Agatha Christie, you get a bunch of strangers who are all on vacation together or they happen to be on the same train car, but some of them you get small communities that have known each other for ages or that have come all back together for a funeral or a wedding or whatever. And so Glass Onion is like that, where it's like all these people who've known each other for a long time, Last of Sheila, the same thing, and they they have an excuse, in this case, an invitation to a party that draws them all back together. And it is a bit meta. It's much more meta than the original Knives Out was. I would say it's more like an Agatha Christie than, than Knives Out, in that in Knives Out, very early on, the structure of that film tells us that the victim actually killed himself. And that was a very structural decision, right? This one leaves the structural quirk till later in the in the movie. So we've got the characters are all introduced. They all assemble. The detective is with them actually in the assembly, which is a very, you know, Hercule Poirot is at a dinner party and one of them is murdered kind of deal. So I would say I believe you're right in that this one is more of that ilk. But I also felt like it was less so because this one, it's a satire. It it is trying to take the piss out of a lot of contemporary stereotypes, particularly in and around tech and social media and uh, celebrity. And a lot of what keeps this movie entertaining is just seeing those characters bounce off each other and less so the murder mystery. Because the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the initial concern is whether Miles, the tech billionaire who's brought everyone to here- Ed hit, Norton. Edward yep. Norton, is actually going to be murdered. Concern of whom? The audience? The characters? Or- Well, that's what Benoit Blanc is saying is his concern- But look, what you've done this weekend is crystal clear. You've taken seven people, each of whom has a real life reason to wish you harm, gathered them together on a remote island and placed the idea of your murder in their heads. It's like putting a loaded gun on the table and turning off the lights. Oh, uh oh. And, and it tells the audience that that's what we're meant to be paying attention to. Before we can continue on, I just want to say that the, in terms of being an ensemble, 
right? Obviously, mm. this, it's a murder mystery. We need suspects, right? And the difference between this and a film like Pitch Perfect is that we need, to, for a murder mystery to have suspects, we need to understand character motivation. So the audience needs more access to character and perhaps more dimensionality of character than they do in a film like Pitch Perfect. Pitch Perfect structure is ultimately the group dynamic needs to be slightly dysfunctional in order to stop the group winning. And then when they work out how to resolve their bullshit, the group is able to rectify their dysfunction and is able to win, right? That is like the team sports movie, leg- uh, you know, and, and it's often about the interpersonal conflict. That is different. You only have to, and it's got a much, Pitch Perfect has a much broader range of characters. Yep. This film has quite a f- a lot less characters that are better, quote unquote, service. They You, you get more Which time. Is, it comes down to size. And that's why I'm interested in, you know, if you've got something like uh, necessarily, if you were attempting to service as many characters in Glass Onion as you were in Pitch Perfect, which is essentially like 20 characters who all have some sort of defining characteristic, you're, you're going to sell them all short. And so Glass Onion realizes it has to limit them. And it does this in two ways. It does this in this amazing opening montage where even though you meet you meet some of them alone, you meet some of them in like a family or relationship setting where they're with one or two other people, or you meet some of them in a massive party where there's like 40 people around them, and including, you know, Yo-Yo Ma and, you know, lots of back, literal background dancers and things like that. But it's always very clear in the scene who the one person is that you're paying attention to. And then you take all of those people and put them on an island with almost nobody else, one tertiary character. And so you 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 have immediately said, here are the handful of people who are important and we're only concentrating on their individual you know, characteristics, and then we're starting to flesh out their dynamics with each other and their backgrounds and things like that. A couple of things uh, I want to pick up. You're talking about this defining characteristics. Chaz has used the word earlier, which is running condition. It's a word that I really love. A way to think about character is what is their running condition. It's another way that is kind of what is the habitual action of this character. And good character introductions, I think, kind of speak to the running condition or a running condition of the character. And I think Knives Out does a really good job of that with these characters to kind of establish their running condition. Coming back to my private, public, personal thing, it's just, we're also seeing them in in places that they're comfortable, right? So we're seeing these characters in, for lack of a better word, their natural environment, and they're being taken out of that environment and put in something that is more unusual, which puts pressure on the, the characters. And we start to see dimensionality. We're literally seeing the characters in different spheres of their lives. We're seeing them in their the lives that they feel comfortable, whether it's like in the domestic or in the work or in the party. And then we're putting them in a completely different situation, which adds dimensionality to the character. So I think it would probably help us to actually talk through that opening montage and say what the running conditions it establishes from each of those characters, because that will speak to its efficacy. I think if nothing else, you know, if you're wanting to establish an ensemble, watch just that opening montage of Glass Onion, because it is, let's talk about, you know, using Stu's, I want to say dichotomy, but it's a trichotomy. Uh, it's cooperative. They are sent a puzzle box invitation and they, all the characters know that it's an invitation to tech billionaire Miles Braun's, you know, getaway. And they're all in COVID lockdown. Some in bigger bubbles than others. It's questionable that one of the characters knows, but almost all the characters know. It's questionable whether Andy knows when she gets it what it is. I mean, she smashes it with a- She smashes it with a hammer! Which I feel like she knows exactly what it is. Well, that's the conclusion to the montage, isn't it? It she wants to ignore the bullshit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We open We open with Catherine Hahn, who plays Claire. We see her in her house. With her husband and her kids and- And then she goes from that. So her personal life then becomes a pub, like a public uh, work life when she ends up having to record something. What's this? I don't know. I've got the CNN thing. I'm like, now. Amy, come on, look alive. Hold the keys. On in 10, he's leading you in now. Okay. <laughs> It's from Miles. And with me now is Connecticut Governor Claire DeBella, whose Senate campaign is picking up steam as she has positioned herself as a very different kind of candidate. (laughs) Governor, thanks so much for joining us, working 
from home like the rest of us, I can see. Yes, welcome to our office campaign center in kindergarten. We are losing our minds. And it shows she's always aware that the personal is the political yeah. and that they are intertwined and that they will always be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you see her assistant. Everything's there. Right. And then they use that, the connective tissue between that. And that's what makes these introductions elegant is they find a way to kind of connect them. They use devices, transitions, hooks. We've got a whole episode about transitions. So we see her being interviewed and then we cut to a TV that's playing the interview and it's in a lab and then introduces to the next character. So it feels less stuttery. We understand, like, it's not like A, B, C. It's like smoother than that. But it's also with the editing, there's a lot of split screening. There's two, sometimes three, if I remember correctly, four-way split screens that are also that start within this whole montage. Yeah. And so we meet Lionel. Yep. And he's most comfortable at work, which is where he is. He's in the lab. It tells you about what he's doing, but it also tells you who he is. His work is his life. We know that he's working for Miles and that Miles yep. sends cryptically random faxes <laughs> that he has to interpret and implement into genius, yes. I know, I know, I know, but what can I do? You can tell him, tell him no. no. Lionel, you're a scientist, not a publicist. Exactly. You can't keep making excuses for every one of Miles Braun's insane whims. Genius always looks like insanity at first though, right? Isn't that how he became Miles Braun? You guys have no idea. The man faxes me in the middle of the night. He loves his faxes. He sends me his ideas that I'm supposed to. You know what, you tell me, genius or insanity? Uber for biospheres. I don't know. Okay, maybe. AI and dogs equals discourse. Okay, I mean, all night long. And then after Lionel, we go to Kate Hudson's party. So she plays Birdie J. Again, they use the television as connective tissue to help unify it, um, which is something I think we'll talk about in Ensembles 3, about unification of ideas. But they use that to go in there and we see her in a party environment, right? Massive environment. We we get one or two people who are sort of pulled out. So her PA peg and, you know, a couple of other big quote unquote name celebrities like Yo-Yo Ma who show, you know, what she's into, but also just the fact that she, there's, you know, 40 people, she's drinking, she's doing coke, she's, you know, really effusive. It, it And it's during the daytime. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's like 11 a.m. Yeah. She's, you know, doing lines and- Drinking a mate, yeah. Absolutely, it tells you who she is, what she wants, in it, and the hard contrast between, you know, her and Lionel and Claire, whom we've all, you know, the contrast is really quite strong. Yeah, and we, we kind of seeing them in the environments that we're presuming they're most comfortable with, or at least it's comfortable is not necessarily the right word. It might be the ones that they're in most, most common. Prolific? Most yeah. common environments that they common. tend to be, you know. Natural habitat. Yeah. I like that. That can be added to the Down Zero <laughs> glossary <laughs> slash dictionary. Natural habitat. We're seeing the character in their natural habitat, right? Yeah. And then we end with the Dave Bautista character, Duke Cody, who's like an Andrew Tate equivalent. Yeah, and then they twist it because you got him being all like super alpha shit and we meet his bimbo -y girlfriend. And his mom. And then that's the twist. His mom who's there, yes. The turn is that he still lives at home and he's preaching yep. all this stuff about masculinity if he still lives at home, right? Yeah. We don't actually end there. We end on Andy, I believe. I'm just saying because what you get is five very different people who you wouldn't ordinarily believe to be friends. And you might go, oh, they're all connected via Miles. But what this cleverly does is each of the different puzzles get solved by different characters. So it's showing them all bringing different facets of their friendship to a group to solve the puzzle. And then it gets to the end and we meet Andy and she's staring at the box and she just smashes <laughs> it with a hammer, having not been on that call with the others. Yeah. And they're all solving it in different ways, which reveal their personalities. You know, whether it's a puzzle personality, whether it's an analytical personality, whether it's a, I'm going to use my husband or my mother or my whomever <laughs> to solve this. You know, yeah. they're all they're all bringing that to the way that they solve it. And you're right, the group call is really interesting because, you know, what better way to exhibit who they are than how they interact with, yeah. you know, someone that they've known for 20 years. So. Mel, you were asking me, how is that group 
expressed in public because the the remainder of the film is them getting to the island, the murder playing out, and then the the resolving of the the murder mystery, right? I would say that group being in public is the film because Bernard Blanc is there. They normally go on these retreats as a group without anyone witnessing them, right? And they're allowed to let their hair down and be who they were when they came together as a group, right? That's the the alleged joy of them. And it's certainly, I think, what Miles gets from them. But because Bernard Blanc is there, he is an outsider. They are all having to be highly, you know, even more performative or maintain their performance throughout the runtime of the film until the end. <laughs> and I, I think that is interesting because it is something that I think rings true for a lot of people is that we can fall into our own personal running conditions when we were certain groups of people. You you go to your high school reunion and suddenly you <laughs> end up in the similar dynamics, right? You go to your family and you end up in the similar dynamic and you may not be that person outside of that environment, yeah. right? So, it is, it's an interesting way of showing dimensionality of the character. I think for me, what is interesting is we, we've talked a little bit about character questions and look, if you're not sure what we mean by character questions, we've got a whole podcast with Stephen Cleary about character questions and versus plot questions. But essentially, they are questions around like, will this character come to learn something about who they are? And what makes them more difficult is that they're not as easily demonstrable as plot questions. You know, will they defuse the bomb? Can you solve the puzzle A clear plot questions, right? But will this character learn to overcome their puking on stage, as in Pitch Perfect, <laughs> is something that you can kind of, like, they hold, like, they do that, they make that a character question because it's really a character question about anxiety. Murder mysteries, for me, coming into this, knowing this is a murder mystery, the character question is kind of very tied to plot. Like, it's a character plot question, and it is, is this person capable of killing Miles? And why? What motivation do they have? But back to it being an ensemble, they all, at the very beginning, as an ensemble, the whole reason that murder mysteries have to be an ensemble, at the beginning, you you have to believe that they all are for one reason or another. Um, and even at the end, you, depending on the type of murder mystery you're writing, like that's why it's n necessary for it to be an ensemble and is for all of those characters to have that potential in them. Yeah, and, and it's doing a trick because from memory, really, the first act kind of turning point for this is blank saying to Miles, I think you're going to be murdered, right? So it sets you up thinking it is about the murder mystery of Miles. And it isn't, you know. I'd, when do we find out that Andy's- Well, that's after the midpoint. So just before we get to that midpoint, because I think all of this character dynamic stuff shifts very much after the midpoint, which is- Ryan Johnson doing his big structural shift that recontextualizes everything before. What I find interesting about Glass Onion in contrast to Knives Out, in Knives Out, we got lots of opportunities. We had the classic interview montage in Knives Out where you saw each individual character giving their answers to the cops about the question. You then got to see lots of little group dynamics around the, the dinner party in, in Knives Out. I'm not gonna go back over Knives Out, but. In Glass Onion, I, what I thought was interesting is that throughout, there's very few scenes in the first half of the movie where there's actually not the entire group there. So we've got that big opening montage. We've then got how Bernard Blanc gets onto the dock. But then we've got the, the dock and all the characters arrive. They're all going. They're all on the boat discussing Andy. Like we see Andy is separate to the group, but the group is all feels like a one cohesive friendship group. Hmm. But then they kind of splinter off, don't they? Like, after they get to the island, aren't they sort of like one-on-one -on -one and two-on-two -on -two for maybe half an hour? No, because then they go, they've got that pool scene. They meet Miles on the beach. Mm -hmm. Then you've kind of got the pool scene where they're all coming and having drinks and introducing how they all know Miles, that they're all disruptors. And it's then when after that scene where Blanc goes off kind of by himself to smoke and investigate in that amazing, I don't know if it's a romper or a two-piece but it's amazing and I want it. But at that point he sees, you know, that Miles seducing Savannah being watched by Dane Cody, by the Dave Bautista character. But I don't feel like we see lots of the other characters separate before they come back. We don't. For the dinner. That all happens after in that second half 
after everything gets recontextualized. Because then we've got the big scene between Benoit and Miles. We've got the the big dinner. Mm. And and in, at that dinner, the death happens, right? Like that's the, the first act turning point. So they've actually, I, I can only think of two or three scenes in the whole first act where it isn't almost every character is is in that scene. It, I would say the first two acts, but that's... Yeah. I, I, I think something like this, a three-act structure, is just too broad. Okay, okay. Until the murder. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yep. right. There you go. Yes. I'm just saying there's a long period of the film where Ryan has a lot of characters on stage and they're all bouncing off at each other. There's mm-hmm. you, get, you get little indications of tension and conflict, like where... Dane shoots the gun at the pool and they're all like, oh, fucking Dane, right? But <laughs> but it's not until after the the kind of structural trick, and I, I'm going to spoil it for everyone mm-hmm. now, <laughs> mm-hmm. but Janelle Monet's character Andy gets shot and then there's a flashback to where we learn that she is the twin of Andy and that Andy has previously died apparently by suicide, but she doesn't believe it. And that she and Benoit have been conspiring to come to this event to try and bring out Andy's murderer. And it's following on from that that it recontextualized moments and we get to see more of the moments, like the moment between Claire and Lionel at the pool. And what we learn is that, and this is what I actually find quite interesting, all of those characters need Miles, right? He has made them dependent on him because he needs their kind of adulation. Claire needs Miles's political donations and influence. The Kate Hudson character, what's her name, Birdie, she needs his money, even though it's going to cost her. Like she's about to get dragged for, is it a sweatshop that burnt up in Bangladesh or something like that, that was actually Miles's supply chain, not hers, but she's going to take the fall. Lionel, obviously his entire He's the implementer of a company that is run by Miles. They all need him. What I found interesting is that Dane Cody, he's the only one who actually wants something more from Miles. Like he wants something positive from Miles, not the withdrawal of something that he's getting. And it's fascinating to me that in terms of the group dynamics, that they made the one character who actually wants something from Miles is the one that gets killed. Hmm. That, that, that was my observation from group dynamics in terms of all the other ones have very similar. I would largely say the group dynamic is combative between the people at the dinner party. And it's certainly the group of friends is combative with Blanc because they're like, why are you hmm. here? Right. That's why there's some like there's some flexibility, like sometimes when they have to be they collaborate or at least they feel like they shift when Blanc is around because they're like, oh, well, this is the outsider. Or, oh, he's out to get us. Yeah. Or, oh, we're not sure what's happening, but we'll turn on him as a collective. And look, I, I, you could do a close reading of the film to look at, at the moments that subgroups of characters are like cooperative or competitive. Certainly Miles and Duke Cody are played as somewhat competitive about for the affections of Whiskey, which is Duke's girlfriend, right? That is revealed. And there is that moment, as you say, when Duke shoots the gun that all the characters look at them, so they're kind of cooperative. But we're not here to do a closer ending. I think those dynamics are in there. There's just my, my observation with that first half, coming back to that, like, you know, private, personal public. One thing it does very well is that it does choose its reaction shots very well. So you're, <laughs> you've got these group shots of everyone in the group, and then they have these moments where they cut to a close-up. And for me, cutting to a close-up in such a way and just having a moment of character interiority, like particularly when they're not saying anything, when it's just a reaction, is actually a moment of private, often a moment of privacy between the character and the audience, right? And it, it almost gives us information about the character, gives us more access to the character that we kind of almost assume if they're in a single, you know, like, and it's just a small reaction, it feels like a moment of privacy because we don't think anyone else has seen it, right? And so it's a good way on the page that you can build a relationship with the character if that you just write in the reaction shot in such a way, you know, that it, it, it is um, feels like it's a moment of, like, intimacy, of privacy with this character. And it helps 
helps break up those group scenes. Because you're absolutely right. It is pretty much group scene, group scene. We see a little bit of Peg with Miles. I think we see a couple of the characters with Miles beforehand. But it is the second half of the film that we start to see the group dynamics in smaller chunks. Like that we structurally split the group. You know, we talked about that in the previous episode, this idea that the group comes together and then you split the group apart and they come together. This film does it in the same way, but in terms of the revelation of information. A hundred percent. And I would just say, I think this, you know, if you're looking for an example, like this one to me stands out in that it reveals almost everything you need to know about the characters in a group setting. Like you've said, Stu, you get those little moments of wordless reaction, which you can write into a script, you know, hero on... Birdie's disgust, for example. Would you put hero on if you're writing a script? Like I would not. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Just checking. I'm, I'm like, just, uh. I'm just going back to Stu's uh, previously stated goal to eventually write hero on in a script. That you could, if you want to make it clear that they've got a reaction that no one else sees, it's like, uh, you know, almost unnoticeably or, you know. It's directing on the page without directing on the page. Family Stone, when we get to it, has some like had some great reaction shots in the background. And I thought that's part of the reason that film felt like those made those characters feel like they're alive is that they actually reacted in character, even if they're mm. like fucking out of focus. <laughs> right? And it was cool. After Dane dies, it does show each of their reactions being true to their character. And I guess part of the comment, you know, you can't really discuss group dynamics because they basically all want what's best for themselves. That is the point of this film is how selfish all these people are and how self-absorbed all these people are and what they're willing to compromise to maintain the public image of themselves. You know, there's not so much of a cooperative or competitive or combative. It's just self-preservatory. Yeah. I would I would say they ship between the shit. <laughs> They're cooperative to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Like they do move between those dynamics, but the power relationship is very interesting. Yeah. So my question is, right, coming back to this idea of accessing characters, right, feeling that you know who these people are. It feels to me that the nature of the film of having a detective character as our primary point of view character means that the, the detective, the story, has to be structured in such a way the detective has to learn who these other characters are in order for them to do detecting, right? So, naturally, as an ensemble, it's going to be building in those moments where he learns what their agenda is, what their wants are, what their needs are, right? And I think it- Five Cream is a whodunit as well, <laughs> but there's not a clear detective character that is trying to solve yep. the thing, yep. right? So, we the film has to do other things, right? Yeah. I think they're similar in that what, what, what Glass Onion does is in introducing these characters, by the time we quote unquote catch up to Blanc, it assumes that he knows some of these things. And part of that's a structural thing, right? Whereas we learn later that he's- gleaned information of them from their public profiles and from knowing Janelle Monáe's character, who we think is one and is later the other. But you're correct in that it it is different, but I think script-wise, it's similar. It assumes that Blanc knows most of the things the audience knows, at least by the time you get to the deduction part. Mm. I guess really it's just me wondering aloud if part of the enduringness of detectives as a character type is that the detective to detect means they need to access character. Yes. And that means audience accesses character. Yes. Right, through the point of view. Which is why in an Agatha Christie movie, one of the first things you learn about all the characters is are they selfish? Are they greedy? Are they altruistic? Are they romantic? Are they this? Like when they are introduced on the page, like if you're reading it as prose, it gives you that because ultimately that is something that the detective must suss out or must observe through actions or must, you know, determine through questioning their closest, you know, friends and enemies and whomever to answer the central mystery. And I think that is, I think you're exactly right, that the detective needs to either determine or have known that to solve the mystery because it's it's not just a question of who done it, but the how and the why and ultimately the human condition, if you will. And that's at the heart of a generally enduring mystery, which 
in a lot of ways does tie us into five cream in terms of like a scream is it's why are these things happening? It's a character question. It it comes back to a wound. It comes back to history, you know, and these are very meta things, but it's overtly stated. But the murders happen because of a history, because of a past, because of a personal connection. And it's the same in a mystery as it is in a slasher. Thank you, Mel, for once again transitioning us. I, I set that up. Oh, you set it up and I spiked it. We're like a volleyball team right now. Hello? It's happening. Three attacks so far. Do you have a gun? I'm Sydney Prescott. Of course I have a gun. Something about this one just feels different. Samantha, I'm, I know who you are. I've been through this a lot. This is your life now, which means that whoever this is is going to keep coming for you. You ready? One of the things that I really like about Scream as a franchise is that Ghostface does generally die in each movie <laughs> and all the characters are aware that there is a new Ghostface and that prompts the whole who done it, how done it, why done it as a primary driving and also character like it's a character question but also an audience question like part of us is sitting going who is it which one of them is it why are they doing i mean why are they doing it is kind of which two of them are are it yes yes <laughs> speaking of ensembles and collaborative group dynamics cooperation <laughs> and in our case combative group dynamics <laughs> here's a word from our sponsor Arc Studio Pro. When it's time to write, you need to be able to focus on the words and nothing else. Arc Studio understands how screenwriters think. They've created screenwriting software for the 21st century, one that doesn't distract with an overloaded interface. Say goodbye to archaic, outdated screenwriting software and hello to advanced story building features industry standard automatic formatting and stress-free collaboration that is easy to use as Google Docs. Arc Studio is already used by beginners and professionals alike, such as the team behind the Netflix show Arcane and by David Wayne, writer-director of Wet Hot American Summer and Role Models. Join the thousands of screenwriters who have already made the leap. Arc Studio offers a completely free plan but you can also get $30 off the pro plan if you visit the link in our show notes or draft-zero.com slash arcstudio. So again, if you want $30 off the pro plan, check out the link in our show notes. So should I take a spin at trying to summarize mm -hmm. Five Cream? Mm -hmm. uh, so it is the fifth entry into the Scream franchise, you know, made famous it originally by its meta commentary on the slasher movie as a genre previously. And so this fifth entry is a reboot or a requel of the franchise that has a scene debating how it is a reboot or a requel of the franchise. And I mean, I watched it for the second time with my sister and one of the things that I love so much about it is that she's like, she's one of those like really engaged movie viewers where she'll be like, no, you idiot, drive away. And in this film, every time she would yell out something like that, one of the characters in the film would say that thing. And that was very uh, rewarding. But it is a slasher movie set in Woodsboro. There is a history. A, this is now the fifth time that a killer obsessed with scary movies that wears a ghost face mask shows up to stab people. These are so meta that the Scream franchise internally has a franchise of movies based on it called the Stab franchise. And the rules are... Rule number one, never trust the love interest. They seem sweet, caring, supportive, and then welcome to Act 3 where they're trying to rip your head off. I was with Sam in Modesto when Tara was attacked. And let me guess, you were just in the other room, conveniently unaccounted for when she was attacked at the hospital. Okay, do I have to take this from shitty Sam Elliott over here or what? 
Rule number two. The killer's motive is always connected to something in the past. I'm related to Billy. Right, but then why kill that random Vince guy? That's for you to figure out. And rule number three, and this is the most important rule. The first victim always has a friend group that the killer is a part of. Does your sister have a close-knit group of friends? Yeah. She does. Then look for the killer there. If you can find out why they're doing this, you can figure out who's next. Okay, so I'm just going to say now, and the spoiler is, it is the love interest. Uh, I think, I, and when it happened, I was like, this makes sense. Love interests are a good villain in this case of film because you get to reveal a lot of character. You spend a lot of time with this character naturally because they're hanging out with your primary point of view character, right? So you get to kind of service the character in such a way that we get to know them in a way that feels more organic rather than cut to and then we're like, oh, maybe this is the villain, right? So can I quickly, I guess, list off the characters of this ensemble and the difference being, I guess, they, this genre faces a very different challenge and I think pulls it off just as well as Glass Onion. Stu, your point that you just made with Glass Onion is for Bernard to do his job, he is, as the point of view character, finding out people's possible motives for committing the murder, right? Whereas in this franchise, you've still got a lot of suspects because you need to kill them off and not be left with only one person who it could possibly be. You need to kill off a few and be left still with a a group, right, in which it should be shocking and have a climax with. But because of that, and because we don't have a detective, the the challenge on the screenwriters is how to distinguish these characters, how to quote unquote service these characters, how to give the audience access to these characters with, I think, less motivated screen time than is in Glass Onion. And I think this script does very well. I've got a pretty quick, like, how all the and what time they're all introduced in the script. So it's up to you if you want to, like, list them all, if you want to. Go for it. If you if you got it. To me, I'll almost be interested to hear as Mel introduces them, because that is as the audience gets to hear about them. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so we've got this iconic opening scene, which gives us Tara, who is the quote unquote iconic character. It also sort of like sideways introduces uh, Sam, who is her half sister, because we see her through a video screen. So you've got the introduction of your two main characters. In the next scene, we meet Sam for real, so in person, and her boyfriend, Richie. So now we've got three characters. And then the next scene is four characters at once. Oh, nice. This is Tara's group of friends. And they're talking about how they know her and they, it's very meta. Like we find out, oh yeah, you're a brother and sister and you're all related and you're all friends. Can I, can I just interrupt for one second? Yep. The scene with Sam and Richie Mm -hmm. has a phone call from one of those four friends. And then we come into that scene with those four friends discussing what did she say? Which is very Glass Onion-y, yeah. right? Where where it's, there's a direct link from scene to scene. So now we're already up to seven characters within the three scenes. They quickly have established their relationships with each other. We've got very little distinction at that point with the four friends, right. I would say. The distinction is mostly visual. Yeah. The distinction is like, oh, this one's kissing that one. Mm-hmm. Clearly they're boyfriend and girlfriend. This one has red hair. Clearly they're alternative. You know, it's it's these sort of things that you can see on the page. And then we get Sheriff Judy and a cutaway to creepy Vince, who's <laughs> yeah. Kyle Gallner, who again, this is my talk about like, mm. oh, we cut away to him leaning against the car. We know immediately who he is. They're talking about Tara, who didn't die. We also very quickly in the next one, maybe two scenes are talking about the three originals. So their personalities, their roles, we know, et cetera. We're 12 people. This is to me a classic example of the challenge that this genre poses and the amount of resources that a a screenwriter has to spend. Because I don't think there's much conflict in these scenes, right? Like Sam's like, I'm going to go and rescue my sister because she's been stabbed almost to death. And Richie's like, I'm coming. Yep. <laughs> the friends are like discussing, should we share our location on each other's phones so that we can be somewhat safe? But again, they're all sort of together and aligned. There's no real conflict in that either. They all want the same things broadly. 
But then they've got a scene where they're all visiting Tara in the hospital all together. All of these characters that we've mentioned. And Richie is the new person. So Sam introduces then to Richie. Right. So we've then re-established that there are, first of all, are two discrete groups at this point. There's Sam and Richie, and then there's the, the five high school friends. All these films, and The Family Stone will as well, have had either a very clear audience surrogate or sort of a newbie who allows a character to do that like soft introduction sort of thing, which is very handy when you have a large ensemble that you need to explicitly introduce two scenes in a row they've done that they've name checked so in terms of a challenge to ensemble they've had two scenes in a row where every single character is name checked right and then after that scene in the hospital you've got a scene with the five high school friends again in a pool hole yep where again because it's very meta that allows this a little bit more than some franchises. But yeah, they're all saying, oh, what, what, why do we trust this boyfriend? Oh, well, doesn't she hate her sister because she left? Like it's give, it's filling in all this backstory. And again, name checking some of the legacy characters that we haven't even seen again yet. And there's still not much conflict. I'm just saying they've spent three scenes in a row just letting us kind of be introduced to these characters. Hang out. And they've had to spend that time for us to get a vague idea of who they are individually and in relation to each other. We still don't, I think, have a very firm grip on that. But given this number of characters, I thought it was interesting that they basically had four back-to-back scenes of non-stop introduction of characters. They, they do it very efficiently and very quickly, but it's only after that Paul Hall scene where there's the second kill of your... Yep, and that's 21 minutes in, and we've already had all those introduction scenes. And it's only after that scene that the group start peeling off with their own kind of missions. I would say the one other moment in the first half of the movie is when Dewey has kind of been brought back into the mission and you've got the three groups together. You've got Dewey representing the old guard... You've got Sam and Richie. Sam, I would argue, is the protagonist and point of view character of this story. Oh, yeah. But they're they're in the twins' house. And, you know, you find out that their uncle is, you know, legacy character. And Heather Maserato, yay! Yeah. And you give one of the twins, you give her an opportunity to be the, the Randy stand-in to explain the rules. And that's the first scene and it's good where there's actually driven conflict because I think it's Wes who accuses Sam of being the killer. I think it's pretty clear who the killer is at this point. Who? You? <laughs> it makes perfect requel sense. That actually does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Fuck this. And because she can't rebut it, she walks out and that's the first time that there's actually been conflict within the group or this larger ensemble. And again, I think within the ensembles, there's three groups. So in terms of legacy characters, they, they're reintroducing the characters to the audience to show what has changed, mm-hmm. right? To show what has changed, but you also need, if people are seeing this without having seen all the rest of it, they still need a really brief, who the hell is this yeah, person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is their job and what is their connection and how are they related? I mean, Sydney Prescott has been name-checked in the cold open when it's like, who is the lead of the stab movies? Yeah. Right, with the quiz, of course. Yeah. So the Dewey thing is, it's. I'm just going to end up talking about it at the end, but I'll bring up the word now. A lot of what we're talking about in terms of like introducing characters kind of reminds me of environmental portraiture, which is a type of photography. So we see Dewey in his trailer house looking longingly at Gail Weathers. So we reestablish his relationship with Gail, that they're no longer living together. He's kind of washed up a little bit. He's a bit of a drunk, you know, and that helps the audience that have seen the previous films plus the returning audience kind of catch up to where the character is. And it is, as you say, a big ensemble that's broken into three groups, right? And I think largely these groups are, in the terms of the intergroup dynamic, is a competitive, right? At moments, they're cooperative, but like they're competitive not in the sense of- They're all trying to find out who the killer is. Yeah. 
while not dying. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's like parallel play stuff, right? That's what I mean by competitive, that they're all trying to solve who it is independently from the other in terms of my understanding of how I'm using the word competitive. But other, you know, I'm just trying to make alliteration to make it easier for people to remember <laughs> rather than it being a particularly accurate. Like a great Baptist preacher that you are. Well, I've only got one other big observation from this film in terms of learning. Like other than, hey, guys, everyone check out the time that they took to firmly establish these characters and spend time with them. We're then mostly in Sam or Dewey's point of view. And it's interesting that after the very next attack, which is on Wes and his mother, that they that they then team up. They then get in a car together. But I, I had, even by that point, we'd had three group scenes with the friendship group that we know the murderers stem from. That's the rules of the franchise, right? And I still had very little separation or idea of who the individuals were in that group out of- uh, Audrey, the twins, Liv, and Wes, who's now dead by that point. I've got the best idea of who um, Mindy is just because she gave that speech about the franchise. But I still really don't have much of an idea between the four of them. I then felt by the end of the film that I had a very good idea or I felt that I knew their lived experience because they deliberately take time in a party scene to make them, they change the group dynamic. It changes from we're trying to find out who the killer is to in that party scene, I think the killer is you and I'm now behaving fearfully of you. And it does that in a couple of one-on-ones. Yeah. Which is great. Not just one, but in, in like multiple different. I think it's three one-on-ones that yep. <laughs> they do it, right? How do you know I'm not the killer? Because I am. I'm not actually, but let that be a lesson. Don't trust anyone. And it resolves with no character in danger. But just in terms of this particular exercise, that is in the last third of the movie. And that is when they are taking time, not just for tension reasons, but to make you feel for these characters when they die. You're right. It's not just for tension. It's for that connection. Um, And I think it does a really great job of giving you a reason to connect or relate to all of these characters. Do you think that these characters are leaning into archetypes, like either into them or deliberately away from them? Certainly within Scream archetypes. (laughs) Yes. But you also, when it's this massive of a cast- to some extent or another, you have to. And you're just assuming that within your audience that someone is going to relate to one or two or more of these archetypes, and that will help you. Um, And even we're at the point now, right, where, you know, having made movies for as long, even if you're subverting the archetype, that in and of itself, it's an archetype. Yeah, I mean, they kind of hang the lantern on, like, Chad. And he's literally (laughs) called... Chad. He's literally called Chad. He's a <laughs> twin, you know. <laughs> you know, you think I'm Jock is trying to get into the pants of my girlfriend. And when he's given that opportunity, he kind of turns us down. And that's just an interesting example coming back to my, you know, public, private, personal. Like, even though it's a party, they kind of hero out. They're making out on the couch. And the moment between them where he is like, as as Chad says, like, I'm 99% certain you're not the killer, <laughs> is a personal. We get to see him be afraid, Mm. right, in a way that we haven't seen him before. So it adds dimensionality to the character. And he is pushing against that. For him, the marker of intimacy is getting the um, find my friends request. Invitation. Yeah, yeah. Accepted request. So, And and that is interesting because that's something that's also set up. So he's got a clear want in relationship to his girlfriend, which is separate from the, the murder plot. Set up in the very first scene where we meet them. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's a payoff for the kill, but it it adds dimensionality to the character and makes it feel like he's got a life outside of the film. Yeah. I just want to round out, I think, or an observation about Five Cream and dimensionality. I don't think there are many characters that are three-dimensional in this film. I think Sydney, unfortunately, is the least 
well drawn of the characters here, but they add a level of dimensionality by showing that she's now a parent. This is a facet of a of her that we haven't seen before, right? And they show Gail and Dewey as separated. That adds dimensionality. And then we realize it was Dewey that left them. We're literally seeing another side of their relationship. But I think what is interesting about like the Richie and Amber dynamic when they're revealed as Ghostface is that revealing them as being duplicitous, I'm butchering that word. You actually pulled it off. That's what, that's the best pronounced word yet. But it, it actually literally gives them a second dimension because we're revealing that there is another side to them, which is they're crazy serial killers. <laughs> so giving your character secrets that they then reveal is a great way of just adding a second dimension or a third dimension to them. If that is what you want, maybe you want one dimensional characters. Like I think there is something to be said about the John Carpenter kind of like lean, mean genre machine in which you don't really get to know the character. Like we don't get to know Snake, particularly in Escape from New York, but he's a fucking great character. So he wears great pants. What else do you want? I I just wanted to say that like the big contrast with Glass Onion is there they set up all the they've got the big character question set up, the character distinction set up, these big group scenes all early on. And this film does do that to a lesser, far lesser extent. But they, they're they not afraid of, in the third act, dedicating time to giving characters dimensionality. And they, like, they kind of have to do that to, to make the, the film power. Look, at the end of the day, no one in this film is a deeply drawn character, right? Like, Again, the uh, the one thing that I see that them doing in that party scene is point of view. We are spending time, and and to Sue's point in terms of the the spectrum of intimacy, they're peeling off these characters to give us one on one interactions, different ones that we've never seen before, and that is bringing out a feeling that these are more. They're, they're bringing out their dimensionality, right? And and I actually think that's why the scene of of Richie in the hotel or wherever they're staying at watching the stab YouTube video. Mm. <laughs> it it feel it's it feels like a tip off in a good way. It feels like it's a we use the language earlier of plants and pointers. It feels like a plant. But it's a moment of like privacy with this character. What does this person in his private time and no one else watching do? Yeah. He watches videos ripping into stab. <laughs> I know that Richie was pointed out as being the killer and turned out to be the killer, but he was my favorite written character. He was the one being the audience surrogate of- Should we go back? Whoa, okay. I vote for not going back to the murder hospital. Do you want to stop at a pharmacy? I need a prescription, but I left the next one at Amber's. Her house is on the way. No, 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 no. I'd be in and out. Do you think you could hold up till Modesto? I don't think so. Okay, what's the address? One, two, three, no fucking way lane. Richie? She needs it. Yeah, and I need to keep all the blood inside my body. So do you. She, please. <laughs> are we done with five cream? Mm-hmm. I think we are. There's nothing harder than joining a family. He intends to give that girl my mother's wedding ring. Especially one like the Stones. She's got this throat-clearing tick. It's like she's digging for clams. Ready? <clears throat> Yeah, they're all watching, you know. They have a funny way of making you feel at home. Hello. You have a lovely home. All the better to entertain you, my dear. Don't dilly-dally there, pretty lady. We're all going to be down here talking about you. She is completely uptight. I am not sleeping with you in your bed, in your parents' no, house. Separate it's bedrooms. It's so silly. Are Everett and Meredith going to get married? Four words. Second, second, second word. word. Beekeeper. Ring. Bride. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. They hate me. They hate me. They just met you. I just figured you'd give her a hard time, have a good laugh, but then back off. Meredith's checking into the inn. And now her sister Julie's giving up Christmas with her entire family in order to be with Meredith. I'm ashamed of all of you. (laughs) Even you. Hi. Hey. Hey. Hi. So, this film came up through, I think, listener suggestions and also a lot of us knowing 
friends and people whom we respect where this is like their big family holiday. I never had heard of it. I don't think any of us had seen had seen it before no? this. Maybe this, I'm just talking about my experience because I know a yeah. lot of people who've told me to watch The Family Stone. It does feel like a very Chaz film. <laughs> I mean, just before we go into it, I, I don't know. The one thing I'm slightly, there's a couple of things I'm slightly iffy on, but the main thing is like, why reference the Sly and the Family Stone? Like, Sly and the Family Stone have nothing to do with his film. The but- Family Stone is the is the engagement ring. It's the rock. It's the massive <laughs> diamond oh that God. they're all fighting over. And my okay. brain just my brain just goes to the band. <laughs> it's also their last name. They are literally the Family. Stone. Oh, I know they're literally that, but they've chosen okay, the name right. for that fucking pun. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like a romantic comedy slash family drama slash like holiday film, right? About a family getting together for Christmas, a family getting together particularly in New England, which has got some class elements to it, I guess, some of the specificities of that. And there is the audience surrogate character, and that's what she is, the the new girlfriend, which is- uh, Meredith. Meredith, who's- Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, in a great <laughs> role for her. She does a really good job in this role, coming to meet the family at Christmas. Which is something that happens. Like, you know, the first time I met Emma's family was, hey, we're, I'm coming and staying with you for five days <laughs> and we've never met before. It happens, right? So, it's it's got a real element of truth to it while also giving us the point of view character into the group dynamic, right? It, ostensibly, she's really worried. The kind of the plot engine is she's really worried whether she's going to be liked with, by the family. And it turns out she is largely disliked by the family except by one of the brothers. <laughs> So this is the romantic comedy element, the kind of slightly creepy, mm-hmm. but, you know, shit happens. And I've heard stories like this where people realize they're dating the wrong, the wrong sibling, mm-hmm. right? I'd also just love to point out that speaking of reveals, this is the second episode that you guys have had me on where Paul Schneider somehow appears as this like sneak MVP <laughs> of the whole film. The other one being, of yep. course, Bright Star. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> I've just blown Stu's mind twice in a row. I mean, I, I, I was trying to work out how that character works. Like, the character <laughs> doesn't, like, he literally just turns up with a present. Because he's played by Paul Schneider. It's incredible. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like <laughs> this character is kind of really charming in a really endearing way, but also, and look, this cast is fantastic. So this is a good example of a film that I think we haven't, we kind of touched on it in the previous episode, but there is, you know, a film with an ensemble cast and there is a film that is an ensemble story, right? And I think this is a film that both has the ensemble cast and the ensemble story. And by that, I mean, it's a story that requires an ensemble in for, for the plot to work. You know, so there's a couple, there's multiple plot threads here. And really it's about the, the dual romance of the, the two brothers falling in. <laughs> falling in. <laughs> oh man, how do I even unpick it? So Everett Stone, who's the eldest brother who's brought Sarah Jessica Parker, him realizing that he's probably not in love with his girlfriend and in fact falling head over heels for Claire Dane's character, who is called Julie. And Julie is the sister of Meredith, of Sarah Jessica Parker. And then her burgeoning relationship with Ben, played by Luke Wilson, right? Who's the other brother. That's kind of like the romantic plot line. There is almost like a C plot, I guess, about Diane Keaton's character, Sybil. I love how you call it the C plot. To me, it was Diane Keaton's plot is the A plot. I'm going for a pun, buddy. Okay. All right. Sorry. I'll let you you play that out. Very tasteless pun because she's got um, cancer, so she's quite literal. The C word. The C word, as is revealed. So that is kind of the, I don't think it's the plot. I think it's the emotional spine of the film or it's a spine. Because I think really the plot as set up in the film that we think of it is this character. The question, which is a character question and a plot question. It's a character question for Sarah Jessica Parker, but it's a plot question, which is, will this family accept Meredith, right, Mm. is where a lot of the comedy comes from. And the answer by the middle of the film is no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yes. And not without good reason. Not not as (laughs) she's presented to them. Yeah, it's the false failure, right, is that Mm -hmm. she runs off because she says really problematic shit over family dinner about- um, and, and and largely runs off after that and then Ben follows her. And then the second film, the second half of the film is about Ben falling in love with her. When will they get together? How is that going to resolve Julie and 
the romance and there is the thread of the cancer storyline and also Everett wanting the family stone. Also, and I think I think this might go to character and how you like reiterate it through scenes is she says problematic shit and then in a couple of scenes later, you, you've seen her say this problematic. She says something that's not problematic, but is read because she says it and now that you know that she that it's read in a certain context and it seems to be problematic and you're like, oh shit. So it's again, it's it's finding a, a narrative thread that you've connected to a character and and hitting that again and again and again in multiple scenes. And then in an ensemble, that's the easiest way to continue a characterization. You can hear that I'm kind of struggling to unpick all the storylines because of mm. compared to the three previous films, this story has the most individual character storylines. And that's going to make me bring up, I don't want to dive into it a whole lot, but Chris Walker, our esteemed editor, um, esteemed by us, um, <laughs> editor put together a really interesting diagram after the previous episode looking at the relationship between the number of stories and the isolation versus interactivity of multiple plot lines. Okay, um, we'll put a link in the show notes because it's better to read about it. But this is a good example of a, an ensemble story that has multiple storylines, which is separate from Glass Onion, different from Scream, and also different from Pitch Perfect, which largely, even if they have little mini character arcs, have a single clear thread for all the characters. They're trying to win the competition. They're trying to solve, like not be accused of murder. And then they're, you know... Um, however you want to structure the glass onion plotline. But I think for the audience experience of, of the plotline is who of them is going to kill uh, Miles. And in Scream is how do I survive? That is the unifying thing. This is all separate storylines. Yeah. And I think I'm glad that we chose this movie ultimately over Death at a Funeral because Death at a Funeral has basically all everyone's storyline is will we get through this funeral ultimately, <laughs> right? Whereas you're right, in this one- and this, you know, this could have been a contender for our part three where we choose movies that didn't have to be ensembles intrinsically by their plot question that have chosen to be ensembles. And look, maybe a holiday movie has to be, a family movie has to be an ensemble, perhaps, right? But this one, they've, they've particularly gone down the road of choosing to have a large family. So, you've got the, the <laughs> yeah during the intro you're like wait there's more of them i think the sub genre requires this to be an ensemble yeah so you've got the patriarch and matriarch of the stone family diane keaton and craig t nelson you've got sarah jessica parker's character meredith and the oldest son uh, everett and then after that <laughs> they've got Luke Wilson's character as referenced by Stu, is that, is that Ben? Yeah. Is he called? Yeah. Then you've got their youngest son, Thad. So you've mm -hmm. got Thad and his partner, and then you've got the youngest actual child of the of the group, which is Amy, played by Rachel McAdams. So they've made a, a choice to have- and, and part of that is to, to present the force of antagonism to Sarah Jessica Parker's character. I'm walking in- to this enormous family that have very entrenched dynamics at a time of the year when family dynamics are at their most entrenched. And then they bring in yet still more characters. They bring in her sister, they bring in the friends, they bring in mm. the, you know, Paul Schneider character. Like they, mm. even after that, you know, yeah. after they've sort of like started bouncing those atoms around off of each other and they're bouncing up the walls and they bring in still you know, three more characters, which is really great. Oh, I've, um, I've forgotten. I've forgotten. There's a. There's the oldest sibling, the sister, um, Susanna. Susanna, who's interesting because she and her kids, and her, yeah. and her, and then her husband, who mm. is mostly off screen, but then shows up. Yep. I mean, Sorry. Susanna's interesting <laughs> because she has a very emotional storyline, but she doesn't have a plotty storyline. I think what's interesting about the entrenched dynamics is they make clear that we see Sarah Jessica Parker and Dermot Moroni, so Everett and um, Meredith, in the car and her being worried about being introduced to the family. And they are very clear when Thad and Patrick are very in the family, they're very accepting of the relationship and loving. It's clear that they've been around for a while and they kind of show the routine, like the natural habitat. They literally, mm. you see the natural habitat of the family at Christmas before Meredith arrives. 
You don't have to be nervous. I'm not. They're gonna love you. I hate her. Amy. What? Generosity. Generosity of spirit. spirit. Thank you. Amy, you're gonna get me in trouble. What? Well, I thought no one had even met the girl. No, I was down in New York in October. Well, that's right, the young man. What was his name? How's that going? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kill Amy. Mm. So, you had dinner with them? So, she is a total phony. She's completely uptight. She dragged us to this friggin' stiff restaurant. She talked the entire time. I mean, oh, you just wait. What? She's got this incredibly grotesque throat clearing tick. It's like, eh, 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 eh. it's like she's digging for clams. The ordinary world of the family and that dynamic. Well, let's talk about that because that's the introduction of these characters and in terms of a dynamic, you're absolutely right. I think for the first half of the film, possibly first two thirds of the film, it's Meredith versus the family, right? And there are various iterations within that, but it's largely in terms of group dynamic. It's kind of her and Everett to an extent on her side versus everyone else. And then everyone else is in sort of a range, right? Like where yeah, you've got Ben spectrum. who clearly has this weird crush. You've got Tad. <laughs> Tad. Tad, Thad, however you mm. pronounce that in Australia, who's like really just a genuinely lovely person and wants to accept her even when she's a bit prickly. And then you've got Amy played by Rachel McAdams, who's just like, the, oh my God, mm. I hate you already. I've barely even met mm. you. You're the worst. Like they, they're like, they clash really hard. And to be honest, if this movie were made now, she would probably have the Luke Wilson character, which is the haters to lovers role. And I'm sure that if you're you know, on AO3, there's probably some fan fiction to that extent. <laughs> but like they're so polar opposite and they clash so hard. And so you've got the whole range. I mean, that's interesting because I'm not sure why they super clash other than uh, Amy. Archetypes. Is- well, she's also pre-decided to dislike Meredith, yeah. which that, that scene has mm-hmm. determined. So what scene am I talking about? The opening scene is Everett and Meredith shopping, and it's showing Meredith's concerns over, like, getting the presents right for the family. Like, she's wanting to impress them. And like she said, you've got the scene in the car between Meredith and Everett as well. But then you spend a lot of time outside of Meredith's POV in the family house with all the different siblings arriving. I think the Luke Wilson character arrives after Meredith and Mm -hmm. Everett, but every other character arrives first. And you see them as this large group of characters in a room, all talking about Meredith, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And all like trying to, yeah. And their dynamics are so well Mm -hmm. established as to what Meredith is up against. And it allows us, you know, Mel, like your point about- all the different flavors of their distaste towards <laughs> Meredith. That is almost their defining character trait. Like that's how they're introduced. How do we introduce these characters to the audience? By how much they like or dislike Meredith before <laughs> they've even met her, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Sybil is also kind of written her off. Like the Diane Keaton character, like she's, if if she's won over, Meredith has won. Like that's why I was like, Diane Keaton, as, as much as I ruined your puns to you, she is the A-plot character to me. It's like, the question is posed is, will Diane Keaton allow Meredith into this family? And I think the biggest thing is that she has written her off as a as a partner for Everett. And it's not until near the end where she comes around and she goes, ah, I'd written her off because I thought she was completely wrong for Everett. I was right. However, <laughs> when it comes down to her being part of this family and, and and entering in through a different venue, oh, actually, I can now see her through a different lens. And you're right. She is the, it's that like, well, if mama's happy, everybody's happy sort of concept. I would argue that she's kind of like, in certain terminology, she's the big bad. Amy is mm. kind of like a little bad, right? <laughs> so Amy is more directly confronting. She's combative. Cartoonish. Mm. Yeah. But it's civil's <laughs> approval. Quite literally caught up in the plot line of the family. The family stone. 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 Hey. <laughs> so Sybil has a ring, right? Her, her mother's wedding rim, ring, which he has promised to Everett that he can propose when he finds the one. And her approval at giving him the ring structures or dramatizes the character question of will Sybil 
accept her as part of the family. And ultimately she resigns herself to giving it to him. And then he puts it on the sister's ring. And and this is when the film becomes fast, which is the subplot stuff that Mel is talking about because Mel's absolutely right. This film is actually a farce. Like it's got a lot of, cli- like the brothers falling in love with sisters and realizing that they are <laughs> dating the wrong one. It's like Shakespearean and, it probably, and it, I'm assuming it predates Shakespeare. Even all the ways, like visually, and that would have to be on the page, but the ways that he puts the ring on when they're in the closet and then they're like trying to duck through different doors to hide from people because you've got all these people in a big house and we we now understand the layout of the house. We know where the kitchen is. There's the whole subplot with them like trying to cook food. Come on, let's get the show on the road, people. She can't get it off. Can't get what off? Grandma's ring. I'm, I'm not doing this on purpose. I didn't say that. I, I hate to say this, but... Please be careful of the setting. Is she all right? I'm fine. I'm fine. Meredith, wait a second. Meredith, how dare you? Meredith, wait a second. Are we opening presents or what? I shouldn't cry. I'm, I'm hmm? not crying. I'm... What? Julie? 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 Oh. Julie? Oh. Where? Where have you been? I just, I just got here. Julie, dear, are you all right? Julie? Meredith? Well, what's she doing in there, Julie? Meredith. Julie, let me in. Meredith. Julie? It is so farcical in terms of you've got all these people and now you've got a physical situation and they're entering and exiting rooms and doors and hiding in cupboards and dropping food on the floor at different times to like hide and be visualized and cycle through. That is such a brilliant, and it's it's something that's really in it. You, you can do it in a small group, but it's really enabled by an ensemble to have that sort of physical slash visual comedy. But that is the third act, right? I'm fully on board. The third act is a farce, but I don't think the first two, the first- Sure. You know, where you play the first four act. The, the first two thirds of the movie, <laughs> I'm in the wrong group. <laughs> um, the first two thirds of the movie are not a farce, I don't think. I d- and I do think they then lean- I think they've got, I think they seed the farcical elements, particularly with how mm, over the top to. Sarah Jessica Parker's character is and the changing of rooms and things like that. But yeah, they seed it. And I think the farcical thing is like the romantic comedy structure of like, by the beginning of the third act, largely the, like we, the audience have realized who should be with who and the plot needs to mm. interfere. They never try to hide that. Yeah. Like the moment you start seeing them interact, you're like, oh yeah, this is the right brother for her. And then suddenly you meet Claire Mm. Danes coming off the bus and you see like (laughs) Dermot Maroney's face change. And you're like, oh yeah, okay, this is clearly where this is going. Well, she she literally falls off the bus. Just the life, which is farcical. Which is, you know, she falls at his feet. <laughs> yeah, delightful. But yeah, the the movie, and I don't. That's the thing. Like, if you were in a smaller thing, the movie could maybe try to play coy and and play its cards a little close to the best. In a big ensemble like this, you are almost required to go big to have those sort of over the top elements. You don't have the time to service all of your characters and to try to make these plots subtle and to try to hit those emotional beats of, you know, Diane Keaton's character. You kind of have to, some of those things have to be written larger than life and then yeah, played that way. But so, this, this feels a lot more grounded than Death of the Funeral though. Oh, sure. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a range. So I think part of what makes it work or feel like a an ensemble story is that kind of similar to Glass Onion in a way, it's a character plot question for a lot of the characters, which is will they accept Meredith is a question that we ask all of these characters. And the answering to that is reflective of character and is answered in the plot that they've been able to dramatise through the family well, giving her the family stone and accepting that she's going to be wedded. So it becomes a way of why do they dislike her? Like, these are the things that we're going to begin to learn about the characters, why they dislike her and those elements. And, yes, they add in a plot line about, like, Amy, you know, she she seems sad and mentions, like, an ex-boyfriend. Like, you know, when we see her get out, her character introduction is she's kind of, like, carrying an NPR bag. Like, they're, like, leaning into the stereotype of her being, like, an intellectual. I mean, they do accuse themselves of being intellectually elitist. They lampshade it because they are. Yeah, and and I think there's I think even Everett accuses his own family at that of that in at one 
point. There's a fucking grammar pun in that climax, like... Not like all of you, she comes all the way up here to ruin our Christmas and, and then she sleeps with his brother? What? I, I slept with your brother. You slept with who? With whom? Mm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was such a great, and it, it's a great misdirect because it's like completely in Kelly, the dad's character, to kind of yeah. want to deflect from. Yeah, he's using the the the, the grammar to kind of deflect because he he's very indirect in the way he approaches conflict, which is different from Sybil. So there's a lot of contrast between si siblings, particularly in the like. Ben and Everett dress completely differently. <laughs> ben yeah. dresses like he's still in the fucking 90s. He's wearing <laughs> a shirt over a long sleeve shirt. I wore all this shit in like 1997 <laughs> and Ben's wearing it in like 2005 when this film came out, right? So, there's all those contrasts with the characters, but they do have that plot line. And then there is like a thread about Thad and Patrick wanting to adopt a child. And that becomes this source of conflict with Meredith at the dinner table, but it gives them a desire that's separate from everyone else. Obviously, the brothers are trying to win over the sisters. So every character in this film, beyond that larger unifying plot question, all the characters, like Sybil is dealing with her cancer prognosis. Kelly, the husband, is trying to work out how to deal with that. They're all given lies separate from the romantic plot lines of their, of their brothers, which makes this feel really rich, I think. As well, an ensemble story. Let's go through all of them. Can I just sidebar real quickly? Okay. And then we can, I actually think it'll lead into going through all of them. Because you were talking about the death at a funeral thing, right? And uh, the UK or the American one, they're basically the same. And you were talking about the, the, the tone and the, but I think that part of the thing is when you get such a large ensemble and death at a funeral, the fact that it's all happening essentially almost in real time, like it's in a very compressed time then something like this, which is happening over several days or a week or whatever, you can be a little bit more realistic. Again, when you're talking about writing an ensemble, you've got, uh, you know, and maybe another axis on that sort of Chris's chart or, mm -hmm. or an element that you have to consider when you're writing an ensemble is time. Are you writing this over years? Is this like a cloud atlas sort of thing, mm -hmm. right? Where like you've got all these people interacting millennia. for years and millennium. <laughs> Are you writing it over a week or two where you do have a little bit more space to allow some of the more realistic elements and some of those more emotional beats? If you're writing this over the course of three hours, it almost has to be larger than life, which is, and it's where Scream sits as well. Although that's, again, when you're talking to access, you're talking genre. And like what Chess said in the very intro, you're turning different dials. And so if you if you look at this at Death at a Funeral, where it's a similar setup, a lot of people closely related, one or two outsiders who are like dating people, et cetera. But the fact that one is compressed into such a short amount of time and the other is given a little bit more space to breathe does mean that the everything from your introductions to your interactions to how combative and competitive you are, et cetera, is skewed along, you know, how much time they are, not necessarily screen time, but time within the story is actually happening. So if you if you want to walk through like how all the characters uh, relate and how well, the storylines play out, I think that having that in mind. I wasn't going to like play out every single story. I was just mm. uh, marveling at what Stu was saying before in terms of how many, you know, we were talking about how to give characters dimensionality, right? So in the first third of the film, we know that there are several characters that have multiple storylines and so feel even more dimensional. But Sybil has, will I give the family stone to Everett so that he can marry Meredith? Will I let Meredith into this family? Which is a related question. One is the dramatization of the other, but it's a conflict. One's a conflict with Everett and one's a conflict with Meredith, right? And separately to her, the entire discussion of her cancer is actually happening among the other characters. There's very few scenes where Sybil discusses her disease with other characters. It's mainly, in fact, Kelly, like the big scene that I remember is Kelly and Ben out in the bleachers in the snow. And that is like obviously completely separate to the question of whether Meredith will come into the the storyline. Everett has this obviously driving storyline of I want the family stone and I want to marry Meredith. And and part of it, they actually have a scene when he's looking at rings after the mum said no, where Thad is like, is this 
is this about mum? He's like, of course it is. And, <laughs> and you know, and the inference to me is that he wants to get married before he mum his mum dies. Mm, but yeah. I think what is part of what they do with Sybil is there's lots of moments of pri- we have privacy with her, oh. right? No one else in the room where she's just looking out the window being sad. And so it raises a question for the audiences, which is why is she why is she so sad? And we're getting dimensionality because we see her look sad. Someone else enters and she kind of puts on the act of being she, the matriarch. And she has that beautiful scene where she's cuddled up with Amy on the bed mm. and neither of them saying anything. We've got Susanna, who's clearly her marriage is in trouble, but they never actually talk about that or resolve it. Mm. I mean, no, they don't technically. I do think when her husband shows up, that's the idea that that they are going, you know, trying and that maybe it's not as... But I don't think that's a shift. I think he was always planning on showing up yeah. and he's putting on the facade and... I'm, I'm just pointing out all the different characters and their their journeys and their character questions that they've s- established in the first third of the Susanna movie. is literally pregnant. So there yeah. is a <laughs> journey to do with her about having a child in a possibly unhappy relationship, mm-hmm. right? But she's also, she's the most grounded of all the characters. She's the one who's, you know, the stay-at-home mum. She's the one that snuggles in with Sybil. She contrasts with all of them because she actually seems the most emotionally intelligent. Are you presuming that motherhood means that you are the most grounded? No, but I think the way she is presented in this film is the way she's she dresses, the way she talks, the way she interacts with the group dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. She is more giving. And we, again, given a moment of privacy with her when Amy is asleep on her lap and she's watching with TV. My, my thing about this film, which is related to you, but I'll just say it now, is that we have moments of privacy with most, if not all, the characters where we see them alone mm. by themselves processing stuff. We see them in personal situations where they're with members of their family and their dynamic is different Right when it's just one sibling or two siblings, and then we see them in public with the entire family. And that's why part of the reason these characters feel so dimensional, because we literally show the audience multiple dimensions for these characters. And that is connected to the fact that they've got these wants outside of it. So, yeah, you've got- We just talked about Sybil. Did you want- What do you think Kelly? Oh, well, Amy's- Yeah, uh, Amy. I mean, Amy is- Her need is dramatised with Brad. Like, she is not just pushing Meredith away before having even met Meredith. She pushes- everyone away and that's kind of dramatized with her first serious relationship uh mvp paul schneider and then you asked about kelly i do think kelly's kind of mission in this film is to try and keep the family together in the impending knowledge uh, the knowledge of his wife's impending death yeah because he's the only one who for sure knows before this starts and then slowly ben is kind of guessed and then yeah. the other characters let in on it, but he's the only one who knows, you know, bef- when this whole thing starts. And what that Christmas means to him mm. in that way more than anyone else, including Sybil, who is like, <laughs> there were many points during this film where Anna and I cringed going, this reminds me of my mom. Like, mom. I can't, that woman. That woman. Okay, Meredith, Meredith. It's just, honey, I can't. Give you my mother's wedding ring so that she can- You made a promise to me. Tough shit. I'm sorry. I know you're disappointed, but think how I feel. I will die of cancer before I, like, be nice to someone I (laughs) don't like. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Hashtag goals, question mark. (laughs) And Kelly and Sybil are given a moment of, like, real- intimacy with just them, the audience and us watching them in bed lying to each other. And it's a great moment, but it's like seeing them in a completely different environment. And Kelly is also given a slight plot point in the third act of the film, which is when he finds Meredith in Ben's room and he keeps it secret. So suddenly he's got a secret. So he's got a bit of an agenda, but- I mean, that plays out very quickly, but that's in the farcical nature of it. Yeah. But we've already shown that he is good at keeping secrets and that other people confide in him, right? Like that is a character trait Mm. that we've seen and that this is, so it makes a lot more sense if you were screenwriting this to go, all right, who should discover them? Well, it's, that makes sense. That's going to be him. 
everyone else would have a different reaction. So I think I actually really like your word mission instead of agenda, Chaz, because it connects to running condition. Like mission, like the mission, a character mission means it may not be a specific plot thing that they want, but they've got something that they want to do. And that thing that they want to do, like keep the family together by being low key or whatever it is, speaks a lot to their character. And it means that when during that midpoint family dinner confrontation where Meredith reveals her kind of bigoted views and the entire family has to sort of rise up in defense of Thad and Patrick. When Kelly bangs the table and puts Meredith in her place, it is a big moment for him in contrast of his running condition. Yeah, but he's kind of like the peacemaker. I just think any parent would want a normal child. God damn you, okay? Civil. Don't civil me. Just for the child's sake, just to make it easier for the child. That's enough! Yeah. I would say that this Light Glass Onion is a film of two halves. I feel like up until that, you know, like Everett, until Julie falls out of the bus... He His mission is very solid. Like, all of you are obstacles in my way. And it's nearly all, like, Everett and Meredith versus the rest of the family until Julie shows up and then closely followed after that, that family dinner. And after that, they do splinter off into groups because there's lots of scenes in the first half, which is big family group. Meredith gets pissed off. She goes off alone. And then the family will talk about <laughs> Meredith behind as a group but separate to her and it's only after that midpoint that we get ben and meredith in one direction we get you know kelly and going off in other directions we get yeah all the all the characters sort of splinter off in other directions building up to that final farcical third act in that you know post midpoint up to the low point part of the film the fourth act as you may yes correct (laughs) (laughs) The interesting thing for me is I can understand why Ben is attracted to Meredith. I think they've done a really good job of showing how Ben's influence on Meredith is calming in a way that Everett's is not, right? I think they do a really good job. The one thing I kind of struggled with a little bit was why Julie and Everett connected. I know they showed us scenes of them walking along alone. So these characters were separated and and broken into just Julie and Everett. Like the plot worked hard to make that and just Meredith and Ben. But I was like, I'm, I don't get that relationship. And which is actually why I liked when the film, when he does the chase after the bus and is like, basically does a declaration of quote unquote love of, of, of infatuation. She's like, let's try again in seven days. Right. I loved the fact that she still leaves Right. And that they didn't kiss and all that stuff I thought was a good reflective of her character. But I'm, what does Julie want? And I mean, I would say she's the least dimensional character mm. in that she's there as a plot device. Yeah. And I just think it's reflective of like, you know, coming back to where we were at the beginning of me personally, I was interested in dimensionality of character. And there's so much dimensionality of so many characters here. Right. The, the film does a beautiful job of, you know, spending time with these characters and and showing them in different combinations so we see these facets to them and i just feel like that feels like a missed opportunity with her right she feels as dimensional as Susanna's husband who literally pops up in a shot right and it's it's partly a then you're talking about priorities but it what what is interesting and hard to know right is how much of this is a screenwriter's priority the director's priority the producer coming in and going ah, cut these three scenes we don't actually give you know care about their so it it you know, without reading the script, it is a little bit hard to tell. And again, in an ensemble, yeah, I mean, it, someone is bound to get a short shrift. Yeah. And they could have gone, well, you know, she is Claire Danes and she's working in the arts. And I can I can certainly see Everett. I, I'll take that back. I, I do think I can see why Everett was attracted to her and infatuated, kind of got an infatuation with her. And she's offering a freedom that he, he feels like is more constricted by his role. But it, it, it's more the how that becomes mutually attracted. <laughs> I mean, it's also partly the function of the movie, but we don't ever really see a scene of Meredith and Everett working ever. No, no. You can see why they think they should be together. I think it, I think it, it works well because we understand why they think they should be together. She even kind of calls it out Meredith, which is good because we go, she's a little bit more self-aware, except in that- Pragmatic. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, she's self-aware except in the dinner table scene where we're basically skirting around it. But it's a scene where Thad and Patrick are talking about adopting a child. And then Julie asks an awkward question about race. You know, basically what race the child should be. This may be a personal question, but do you have a preference about the child's race? Julie. I'm like a little black baby. (laughs) Don't you already have a little black baby? Can you dig it? (laughs) I'm so sorry. I... Oh, it totally doesn't matter to us. I was just wondering. Julie? I'm just so excited about having this child at all. And then uh, Meredith starts asking, like, about nature versus nurture and homosexuality. In a way, she's really talking about privilege, right? Which is, like, like in a modern-day context, the question is, like, if you're a parent, would you want your child to have straight privilege, you know, access to straight privilege or not? But it's not how she phrases the question. Well, do you boys believe in nature versus nurture? I mean, is that all a concern in terms of bringing a child into your house? I'm not sure I follow you. Why wouldn't we bring it into the house? <laughs> And she keeps on going. But even that is a problematic question in itself because it's suggesting that who the parents are give kids straight privilege or not. Absolutely. <laughs> the reason why I was reluctant to, to hand this film over to this exercise was because I did not buy Ben falling in love with Meredith after that dinner party. I did not buy that Thad's older brother would love a woman that bigoted against his brother. So that threw me out of the movie for a long time. You're okay, but I think I think the difference is reading it as bigoted versus mm-hmm. reading it as unexposed and unaware and unwilling to learn. And I think that Ben is that sees not the her- definition of bigotry? <laughs> no, well, <laughs> no, because I think bigoted is would after that insist on their point of view being right. And I think what Ben sees in her is a willingness to. It is a lack of understanding as opposed to an insistence on superiority. And, and again, I think it's a bit underserved, but I mean, I've been asked much more offensive things by much more well-meaning people. And there's that idea of like- But you didn't fall in love with them after they did that. No, I've just been related to them and had no choice. Uh, about, you you know what I mean? Like in a two hour ensemble, it's really hard to, uh, to flesh out, Hey, let's sit down and have a chat about, you know, queer politics or, Mm -hmm. you know, not saying things that are whether intentionally or unintentionally or construed as homophobic, et cetera. But I do think that that it, the movie tries to show that she understands that what she said was offensive and problematic and is willing to learn and to change. And I think that Ben is the one who sees it in there, whereas Everett is the one who's just like, oh, just, she'll be fine, it's fine. Um, Which is interesting, at least. Uh, And again, we're here to talk about how it's writing an ensemble, not here to talk about its (laughs) internal politics, whether they're right or wrong or... The thing is, I think that a lot of that most people in this film are not necessarily meant to be likable. They're just meant to be when you get a big family together and you have to sit through a bunch of assholes saying things. There's a range. There's people who are intentionally assholes and there are people who are intentionally problematic and there are people that you should cut out of your life. And there's also people who are just like, oh, God, all right, you know what? In a couple of years, you're going to look back and regret this. And I'm just going to, like, roll my eyes and make fun of you until that day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right so just to have my two cents i buy that ben thinks he can fix her he's got an infatuation he's literally met with her and then he's like i will find i will prove that she's not who she seems to be like that he's his obsession his whole thing is that she is deceiving herself and everyone around her so i buy that he thinks that if he runs away with her that he can and get her to smoke enough pot it'll yeah. all be fine. Yeah, and and he basically gets her at the bar it's like, you know, I mean I still think she does a bully, but she basically puts rest to his fears that she's homophobic. Or you know, she says Yeah, but at the bar then all she wants to do is shred his sister. But he he's angry at Amy for being mean to her. Yeah, okay. Obviously it works for a lot of people out there. It took a lot for this movie to get me back in, but it did. I was back into the movie by the the farce 
Yeah, I think for me, it's that I find them all unlikable in a way that makes the farce work. All right. What have you guys learned from this little exercise? I'm going to, it's less stuff that I have uniquely learned. So thinking about intergroup dynamics through certain lenses, like seeing the intergroup on the public, on the personal, on the private is interesting. Like I, how the group interacts, thinking about groups in terms of environments and shifting environments is related to that or spheres, whatever you want to call them. That's kind of new learnings. But I think for the writers that are listening, there's a few tools that I use that I think connect to stuff that we've been talking about, right? Which is when we do, um, Jazz and I, we've got literally a document of all the characters in a project we're, we're writing about. <laughs> we have a little thing of what is this character's running condition, right? What is, how do we think about this character? So we actually write that down. We write, and, and this is something that I introduced Chaz to, and you really connected to it, which is write a log line from the perspective of that character, right? And uh, look, I don't think log lines necessarily great pitching materials. They're useful story things. Take log line to me, whatever the fuck you want. We also have an episode you listen to it. But what is the story from this character's point of view? Amy's story in Family Stone is like when her smug older brother brings a pretentious New Yorker to family dinner and wants to marry her. And Amy must find a way for to break them up, right? before he does the wrong thing is a log line from her perspective, right? And I think that is a useful tool to make sure that you're thinking about the the shit that is happening into your character's life, right? And what they're trying to do it, the mission. And then and the last thing which we've kind of danced around with is the character web. So it's the idea that you put your little a character in the middle, like Everett, and you draw the di- lines to their other character names, but you look at characters as having relationships not connected to the main character character, you know, how like Chaz and Mel have a separate relationship than I do with Chaz and then I do with Mel. But it's true. Like you've got a separate friendship that you talk about whatever the fucking weird sports shit. Like you go to <laughs> AFL games without me. <laughs> right. But that that literally gives you dimensionality. Mostly AFLW games for the record. That's true. And I did come and watch AFLW with you for my birthday. Um and I, you know, got I got my woke card renewed for the year. Um <laughs> but it's this idea of looking at how characters relate to each other separately from the main character can be a really useful tool. Translating that in funny ways to dramatize that is, adds complexity, but, you know, Glass Onion, all those friends have separate relationships to each other that is not centered on blank and not even centered on Miles, right? Certainly you see that with the family stone, that the way, there's obviously the family, but there's the way that they each of those individual characters relate to each other separate from the main character. And I think you'd probably see something like that in Scream as well. That these characters do know each other, right? And I think that is a really useful tool that kind of connects to what we've been talking about here. Anyway, what about you, Mel? I think the one of the things that I was studying, and, and I'd seen some of these before and I hadn't seen others, but looking at, okay, because the, the point of this part number two of the ensemble thing is films that necessarily have to be an ensemble because of their setup and their genre. So all these four films we decided sort of had to be an ensemble to work. So how do you set up characters? And then how do you reinforce who these characters are, what they want, what their driving force or characteristics are? Every time we return to them, so you're reminding the audience who they are without, again, having them greet each other like, hello, sister, hello, best friend, hello, fiance, right? Like, how how are you doing this in a way that feels natural, that is constant, that is reinforcing not just what they are in terms of the plot and in terms of the other characters, but what they want, who they are, what their, you know, personality, et cetera, is. So I think that those in, in a way that feels natural and services the plot without feeling like it's just there to serve as plot and forward murder, you know, et cetera, mm-hmm. as it were. So I think that looking at all these is is a fairly good um, case study and, and seeing it across four fairly different genres as it all in close proximity was also very handy. I feel like I've stated most of my learnings I second Mel that I think these four films are all an excellent case study in introducing a large number of characters very efficiently. 
in very different styles of doing so. I thought the one film where the style didn't lend itself to introducing characters, namely Five Cream, um, they had to take the time and you could see that, right? And, and they did. The biggest thing that I took was applying Stu's trichotomy of cooperative, combative and competitive and showing that shift. So when that group dynamic shifted, it then allowed for different dynamics either within the group or from the group externally to other forces of antagonism. That really resonated with me because I was re-watching these films having heard Stu's trichotomy. And yeah, particularly, I think weirdly out of all these films, it was Five Cream and Pitch Perfect that actually I learned more from re-watching through this lens than Glass Onion and The Family Stone, which The Family Stone and Glass Onion are sublimely excellent. But I think like Stu said there, their very genre and their intrinsic, what they're trying to do with the audience facilitates giving the audience access to their, to their characters. Whereas Five Cream and Pitch Perfect, it's almost like the, the genre of the film, what the film was trying to do, did not facilitate giving access to the characters. So they had to come up with different ways of doing that. I think that's a great tying together of our summation and look at how well we work as an ensemble. <laughs> Only almost three hours of recording, although there was a sizable pee drinks break. In there. I'd say we came in at under two and a half, which yeah. is, yeah, not bad. Um, and, and just to kind of like, this is my PS about environmental portraiture or environmental portraits as a term of photography. It's just this idea of showing a subject within their environment. Right. So there's like constructivist approaches to portraiture where you kind of build the environment around them. The idea is by seeing the subject or the portrait of a person in their environment, you reveal who they are. And I think a lot of, particularly in Glass Onion, you look at the way those characters introduced and literally we're seeing their, we're making, they show us their environment. And I think that's a really cool kind of thing to think about what is their natural environment. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you very much. Mel and Stu, I look forward to seeing you next time when we do definitely Riders of Justice and definitely The Woman King and maybe everybody wants some. (laughs) (laughs) We are open to debate. Everybody wants something else. Everybody wants (laughs) some exclamation point, exclamation point, question mark. Yeah. (laughs) Um, uh, As always... Draft Zero is brought to you more often by our patrons, <laughs> given how frequently we uh, release, that should be saying something. In particular, we would like to thank our current top tier Superus patrons who bring you the most Draft Zero most often. Uh, we have Alex, Casimir, Eduardo, Garrett, Jen, Jesse, Crob, Randy, Sandra, and I'm just going to say Taze. Oh. Fees? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I'm American. Don't ask me how to pronounce anything. And you're on a podcast with Stu. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all feel like arguing with either Stu or myself about anything on this episode or anything in general. And you can find many ways of getting in touch with us at our website at draft-zero.com. At the website, you'll also find the show notes for this and all our other episodes. As well as links to support us and spread the word for free via a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Very important for spreading the word. Or if you think that what we do here is worth a dollar or preferably more than a dollar, then you can also find links to our Patreon page to support us getting these episodes to you quicker. Thanks. And um, thanks for listening.